Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Monday, September the 19th, meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners will now come to order. Um, Chair Paisley has the uh, invocation and the pledge, and he is uh, still under the weather. He's participating by Zoom or by phone. I'm not sure which phone, um, but uh, I will I will do those honors. If you'll join me in prayer, please. Father God, we just come before you tonight seeking your wisdom, your knowledge, and your courage, dear Lord, to do the right thing for the citizens of Alamance County. And Father God, we lift up, lift up our chairman, John Paisley, to bring him back to a fullness of health and uh, ask that you be with us all tonight, dear Lord. Give us safety as we travel home from this meeting tonight. Give us safety in here. And we ask, dear Lord, that you watch over and protect each and every citizen of Alamance County, the citizens of North Carolina, our country, and the world, dear Lord. Be with us, be, be the King of glory, the King of salvation, dear Father. For we ask all this in the powerful and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to sit down and then stand up. Um, as many of you may have already heard, we have an event that we celebrated in this last month to recognize our sheriff who has served Alamance County and the state of North Carolina for 50 years. He's a really old rascal, let me tell you. <laughs> 50 years in law enforcement and uh, we had a little celebration for him and uh, friends and citizens a while back, but today our Board of Commissioners is recognizing the sheriff for his service in particular his service to Alamance County 20 years with our Cone of the Longleaf Pine Award which we implemented last year and so Sheriff if you'll come forward and I'm gonna ask you this is a this is an award from all the commissioners so I'm gonna ask the other commissioners to join me with the sheriff down front so you want to you do the honors of that or give them to Craig one of y'all I think Craig was monitoring that thing I didn't know if I uh, hold him or I got him over his head. Packing? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I go on the other side? That way we'll balance out. Why don't you get in there? <laughs> this plaque recognizes the sheriff and his service. Okay, and then from the commissioners, we have the commissioner's award in keeping long leaf time. In keeping with the tradition that has been established two or three months ago, we long uh, <laughs> <laughs> last we present a the, the best burlap sack full of pine cones that were obtained, some say, from the, the oldest pine, pine trees in the state of North Carolina down at the Sand Hills. 
Others say, Brian Baker's backyard. (laughs) (laughs) Sheriff Terry Terry Johnson is celebrating 50 years of service in law enforcement to to North Carolina and Alamex County with a cone of the longleaf uh, emblem on the front. Sheriff, congratulations. to serve in law enforcement for the past 50 years, but it's even been a greater honor to serve my home county with, and look after the people that live here. And I want to thank you Board of Commissioners for working with me since you've been on the board. Uh, we've made Alameda County a safer place, but we've still got a long way to go. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have a recognition for the Junior Police Academy. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. So we have a small sampling of our Junior Police Academy graduates from the 2022 Junior Police Academy. I think we have 12 out of 29 here with us tonight. Some couldn't come for other obligations. Some are involved in sports at the school and practice and whatnot. So, uh, but this is uh, a small, uh, uh, well, about half of the graduates uh, from the program from this year. This is a pretty intensive uh, four-week summer program that we run for uh, it's a countywide effort. You can see officers here from uh, Burlington Police Department, Graham Police Department, Mevin Police Department, and the Sheriff's Office. We all work together to uh, put on this program and uh, for these middle school um, youth in our community. It's a, a countywide program. So we have youth here from, from all of the seven middle school, ABSS middle schools in the county. Uh, so if you'd like to hear from, uh, I know uh, we, we gave you a summary of the program in your packet, so I won't go through those details again, but um, if you'd like to hear from some of the graduates, we'd, we'd love to have some sure. of them share uh, with their, their experiences with you. So Every one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just introduce yourself and tell them where, uh, where you go to school, and then if anything you want to say about the program. So I'm Riley Prince, and I go to Western Middle School. And in JPA, they teach you a lot of life skills, one of those being talking in front of a crowd. (laughs) (laughs) And many more, but I think they always said that you can take what you want out of JPA and that... (laughs) Um, That's pretty much all I'd say. (laughs) Okay, thank you. My name is Anthony Ellington and uh, I go to Western Middle School, and what I'd like to say about the program, it's a really good program. It teaches us about self-discipline, and as he said, stand in front of a crowd, in front of everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, telling us not to make bad decisions in life. So as I said, self-discipline. Uh, so, we, so we did marching and all that stuff in the academy. But I, the most part I loved is that it was teaching us mostly about self-discipline, not to make bad decisions in life. Excellent. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Logan Chandler, Hallfields Middle. I think it basically just set, sets you up to be successful uh, later on, to have a successful job and not be on the streets looking for a home and trying to have a good life. Exactly. Good stuff. <coughs> My name's Keir Strickland. I got a Southern. And the main thing I learned, if you just tell the truth, you'll be more trusted than lying. It's true. Amen. 
Hey, my name is Zanaya Ratcher. I go to Broadview Middle School. And they really just taught me a whole lot of life lessons and to prevent stuff bad from happening, kind of. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. My name is Elijah Regio. I go to uh, Woodlawn Middle School. And they taught me that marching was hard <laughs> and that running miles suck. But <laughs> I really did learn a lot of life skills from them. And if I could do it again, I would. Okay, wonderful. You're awesome. Hey everyone, I'm Chelsea Jimenez, and something that I learned from JPA was leadership, which if somebody leads, um, people will follow you and will lead to success. That's right. Very good. Thank you. I remember you because of your hair. Mm -hmm. It was so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ja'Cory, and I go to school at Grand Middle School. And I'm kind of glad I joined Junior Police Academy because it saves yourselves from bad choices in life. And it teaches you how to be a good person, self-discipline, and always be active. Wonderful. Thank you, son. My name is Owen Russell. I go to Grand Middle. And I, I, they teach you how to be self-disciplined. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kelden Truel, and I go to Southern Middle School. And I learned a lot, like telling the truth and self-discipline. And yeah. <laughs> My name is Jaquel Smith. I go to um, Western Middle School, and JPA taught me about like a lot of life lessons and how if you get on the wrong track, you can keep all you can always have them things to keep what you what you learn. That's right. Very good. Thank you. Hey, my name is Yude Hinton, and JPA taught me self-respect, respect, discipline, and just a lot, a lot of life skills. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. My name is Damari Cates. I'm from Grand Middle, and JPA told me how to better myself and self-discipline. Thank you. Have a good day. Very good. I heard a lot of telling the truth. I heard a lot of telling the truth from all of you. One important thing to remember about always telling the truth is you don't have to remember what you said. You don't have to worry about telling two stories that are wrong, right? You don't have to remember what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. When you guys come out for your awards, you were really loud. You could, we knew you was coming into June because I went and watched your right. celebration and you marched and um, if anybody thinks about the military, get used to marching. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. You are so <laughs> <laughs> He's not afraid to speak in front of a crowd, right? <laughs> Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, showcase our uh, Junior Police Academy graduates. If anyone's interested, there is a link on the uh, agenda packet to watch a highlights video from this year's academy. So check it out. Well, One I thing wanna... I noticed whenever um, you guys were handing out awards, the kids really had relationships with their officers. Mm -hmm. And right. it showed really big time. Thank you all for taking time to do something like that. You are changing the world one kid at a time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. It's our ple pleasure and ple privilege to have the opportunity to work with them. Well, I want to thank you and the, your fellow officers in the Sheriff's Department, deputies in the Sheriff's Department, officers in the other agencies. I think we are blessed in Alamance County to have an interagency relationship with our police force forces agencies across the county and they all work together very well and I think everything runs real smooth so we appreciate that so much as a citizen of the county I know we can rely on our law enforcement when we need them and I uh, just am so proud of these young people so proud of what you've done and the effort and the dedication you've put into your training this summer let's give them another round of applause okay.
Okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, public comments. Uh, first public comment is from Carlos Valera. Mr. Valera, yes. come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your time for allowing us to talk to you guys. My name is Carlos Valera. I'm the uh, ABSS Newcomers ESL Specialist. So today we brought one of our students from the Newcomers Program to uh, make the proclamation for the uh, a month Heritage, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, Festival. We're gonna have this coming Sunday next door. So before letting her know, uh, talk, I would like to talk to you about the uh, ESL program, which is uh, the program we use to serve all the ESL students we have in our community. We have a big number of ESL students. ESL means English as a Second Language right. students. Uh, we have a big number of newcomers who are here just, I mean, just arrived. And we're trying to serve them the best we can so they can learn the language as fast as they can to be able to learn the content they have to learn and to get away from high school. So her name is Evelyn Gomez. She is a ninth grader. She came from Mexico recently. And she's going to give you the, uh, she's going to read a proclamation in Spanish. OK. And here is the uh, translation. We're going to do just in Spanish, but we thought it wouldn't be fair for you guys. Okay. You're right. <laughs> <coughs> and we have two more in here. Thank you. Okay. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Evelyn Gómez. Soy estudiante del noveno grado de la Escuela Superior Cummings. Saludos cordiales de mi parte, de mi familia y de toda la comunidad hispanohablante que orgullosamente represento. Gracias por recibirnos y permitir que nuestras voces sean escuchadas y de ayudarnos a crear conciencia sobre la presencia enriquecedora de la cultura hispana en el condado de Alamance, Burlington. Cada año, la sociedad norteamericana conmemora el Mes Nacional de la Herencia Hispana celebrando las historias, culturas y contribuciones de los ciudadanos americanos cuyos ancestros vinieron de España, México, del Caribe, así como del centro y sur de América. Esta conmemoración empezó en 1968 como la Semana de la Herencia Hispana bajo la presidencia de Lyndon Johnson y luego fue extendida por el presidente Ronald Reagan en 1998 a celebrarse por 30 días empezando el 15 de septiembre y finalizando el 15 de octubre y pasó a ser una ley el 17 de agosto de 1998. El 15 de septiembre es un día importante porque es el aniversario de la independencia de los países latinoamericanos, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras y Nicaragua. 
En demás, México y Chile celebran sus independencias el 16 y 18 de septiembre, respectivamente. Además, el Día de Cristóbal Colón o Día de la Raza se celebra el 12 de octubre. También se celebra durante este periodo de tiempo de 30 días. El tema de nuestra celebración del Mes Nacional de, Re de la Herencia Hispana es Unidos en conclusión para una nación más fuerte. Nuestra di diversidad es nuestra fuerza. Tenemos mucho que aportar a la cultura, economía y al futuro del condado de Alamance. Nosotros representamos una de las poblaciones de mayor crecimiento en los Estados Unidos. Actualmente somos 62 millones de hispanos que vivimos en, el, en los Estados Unidos. En nuestro condado de Alamance, el cual tiene 174 mil habitantes, nosotros representamos el 13.7%, es decir, 24 mil hispanos con raíces en el Caribe, México, Europa, Centro y Sur de América. Nosotros representamos una diversidad, la cual es muy robusta y es una de nuestras fuerzas. Yo les invito a que vengan a celebrar nuestra esperanza y nuestra herencia en el Festival Esperanza 2022, el cual es un festival familiar y amigable que se celebra al frente en el estacionamiento del Centro de Artes de Alamance, así como el estacionamiento del Museo de los Niños del Condado de Alamance este 25 de septiembre, desde las 12 del mediodía hasta las 5 de la tarde. Habrá recursos comunitarios, vendedores, bailes, cantos, por supuesto comida cara pintada, inflables y hasta un toro mecánico. Espero verlos a todos el próximo domingo. Esperanza 2022 es una organización, es organizado por ciudadanos de Alamans por una comunidad libre de drogas y el Centro de Artes de Alamans. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna let you have the flyer for the event we're having on Sunday, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. See you on Sunday. Thank you. This looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> I think I would encourage our all of our neighbors to come out and join our Hispanic neighbors and enjoy the celebration. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Could I get one of those? Sure, we have plenty. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez and Ms. Valera. Or Ms. Gomez and Mr. Valera. Right, got it backwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Now we come down to a public hearing for the economic development incentives for Steratech. Brian Baker and David Putnam. I have a motion to enter the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, unanimous. Mr. Baker. Uh, David Putnam is going to present the information. Okay. You want to do it before the public hearing or after? Whatever works. We'll go ahead and then you can take public comments after. Uh, well, um, it could go either way. You've already opened the public hearing, so if you have anybody who signed up to speak, you can okay. do it that way and go come back to the... Go with comments the first and then... Yep. Okay, we'll start with the... Uh, can, can, I, can I point of order? Um, I truly would like to hear the presentation from the company before I hear any pres any anything from the, from the people of the Alamance County. I'd like to hear what the company is going to present, and then let's hear from the folks who want to talk about it. That's, uh, that's how I would I agree. I think that would be a better opportunity for that's people to be informed and ask questions. So yes, yes, sir. Thank you. So have would you mind closing the public hearing and we'll reopen okay, it then sure. after? I have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All Sorry. in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Well, um, I'll go ahead and 
just introduce myself. It is a pleasure to be before you guys today um, to share information about this exciting project. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll leave it on this screen. I would like to introduce my friend, Mr. Larry Nichols over here, uh, CEO of Stairtech company he's been CEO for for quite some time now. Um, he's come a long way this week. Yeah, he has. <laughs> uh, Larry, do you mind coming up and just uh, sharing a little bit about yourself and the company? Sure. Um, Stereotech is an electron beam radiation sterilization company. Um, it's been around for six years. I've been in the business for 27 years doing the same thing. Um, we started this business because of eminent domain, different company going out of business. But anyway, that was six and a half years ago. And three years ago, I noticed that the we were going to be at capacity fairly soon. So. I talked the owner into investing $30 million to open a facility in the Dallas area. Um, and then about a year ago, we realized that wasn't good enough. We needed more facilities. So um, we found a demand for the sterilization um, services in the southeast area. So we've been looking at this area, Alabama um, and Florida. And Alamance County has um, has a lot of to going for it in that Research Triangle is very nearby. One of our major customers, Thermo Fisher, um, is in the process of opening a facility here. So we're partnering with them <coughs> to start the business. One of the things about the way we sterilize with electron beam radiation, a lot of people think, ooh, radiation, that's scary. We don't want radiation around. Well, the beauty of this is this technology is an on-off technology. The first business that I was working in, we were actually using radiation cancer therapy machines to sterilize medical devices. So if, if you're using that on humans, it's safe, right? <laughs> um, and we have our radiation machines, electron beam machines, inside a concrete bunker that is completely safe. There's absolutely no radiation leaking out. Um, when we turn the machines off, there's no radiation you can go right in the bunker and, and it's safe. Currently, we have a competitor using gamma radiation in this county. And I don't know if you're aware, but <coughs> every couple of years, they need new gamma rods in the facility. So they have mm -hmm. to have those gamma sources transported from Canada down here. All the security involved all along the way is immense. Um, the National Nuclear Security Administration is trying to get rid of gamma because of that security issue. There's actually a, a truck hijacked about six or seven years ago, and the person that hijacked the truck thought he had a truckload of TVs or something. He opened the back of it, saw this green glowing thing, and he's dead somewhere now. Um, the other technology in the industry is for sterilizing medical devices is ethylene oxide, and that's gotten a lot of pu bad publicity lately because uh, people in neighborhoods where those facilities are um, are claiming they are contracting cancer because of the fumes that are leaking out into the neighborhood. So we've got a great clean technology. We plan on buying 85 acres. We only need 10 acres for our facility, 150,000 square feet. Um, but we're buying 85 acres because we want to make this kind of a, a uh, business park for medical device companies. So. That's one of the big things about sterilization. People have to truck it all over the, the country. And if they can build next to a sterilizer, then they don't have to do that. Right. Because we are actually the last step in a, the manufacturing process for medical devices. So who would want to build beside you? When you just said <coughs> somebody would want to build beside you to use your, your services, like? Like Thermo Fisher, Boston Scientific, yeah. Johnson & Johnson, Beck & Dickinson. Okay. Um, smaller medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies that sterilize with our technology as well. Okay. So we're hoping to attract some of those businesses to our complex. Mm -hmm. um, also at our Dallas facility, we are leasing a corner of the building out to um, a microbiology lab that helps support the industry and us. Okay, what kind of folks is, what degrees or masters or high school, what, what are we looking here? Sure. Community college, what kind of folks are going to be qualified to work here? 
engineers ideally for doing what we call part of the validation portion of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably about six or so um, college graduates. Um, quality is huge in this industry and college degree for quality members of our 10 quality people at our current facility in California. Um, I think eight out of 10 have college degrees. And then ship and receiving people for receiving the product, shipping it back out. And those are high school diplomas and the operators that load the boxes on the conveyor, um, high school graduate. And then the people to manage or maintain the equipment, a college degree in electrical, mechanical engineering. Um, our current facility is only 35,000 square feet, so this will be triple the size. So we're, we have 55 employees in California. We are hoping that it'll be about triple that when we're fully operational. Okay, we just happen to have this program called the CAP program, where our high school works with our community college, where our industry, juniors and seniors can do like an internship, go to school at ACC, all without cost, and then they go into that industry starting out working. Mm -hmm. I mean, no college debt or anything. How would you feel about having that program at your business? Well, we currently hire students as interns mm -hmm. from San Jose State University. Okay. Um, they have a great program that kind of moves people into to industry. And so we've been taking advantage of it. And generally those employees, after their internship is over, will work with us you know, for a few years and, or more. Have you met the president of our community college? No, not yet. He's sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> he is amazing. So I'm just, we just want to get our kids, you know, my son's military. He wasn't that college route. I want every kid to have their route, not That's what right. their moms and dads want or their papas <laughs> want, but what they write is for them. And um, I think this is this CAP program is absolutely amazing. What we've seen come out of it, industries from everywhere, and it just pulls Alamance County in together to keep those employees here to continually build our employment base. So I just thought I'd drop a hand. And, and you're right, college isn't for everybody. A lot of people right out of high school, this is a great right. career for them. Awesome. Mm. Thank you. Well, I was going to go around and let each person I'm ask. so sorry. <laughs> While I have but you. Pam, just, Pam, Pam just did the interview. Took the bull by the horns and jumped right in, right, Pam? I'm not going to miss an opportunity to hook <laughs> somebody up with somebody else. Craig, do you have any questions or thoughts? I'm good for now, thank you. Okay. okay. Bill? Well, I think most of my questions uh, are coming from the finance side of your business. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I want to ask this question because I'm not quite certain that this is the proper place to ask. Okay. Uh, you know, I've looked at the presentation made by your company to uh, ask for an incentive, and I was just very curious, uh, how much property are you going to be placing into this facility that you build? And I think you just said uh, 150,000 square feet? That's correct. That correct. What type of property and equipment would you be bringing to, to, to so inside this 150,000 square feet, we plan on building three concrete bunker. Each concrete bunker is a minimum of 10 million pounds of concrete. Um, we'll probably build the first two bunkers initially and the third bunker down the road. When we built our current bunker, when they're building, pouring the concrete for the bottom third of it, that one day it was 144 trucks of concrete. So it'll keep a few concrete contractors in busy for a little while. Sure. Um, and each bunker is about $3 million to construct. And then the linear accelerators are actually changing from linear to a different type of accelerator. But the accelerators that we are using, um, they can be 10 to $15 million for the, the pair of accelerators for each bunker. Um, so it's a very, very sizable investment in, in our facility. Okay. Um, I was mostly looking about, you know, this, this comes down to the fact that, you know, over five years we're going to give you a break on the taxes. And I was curious of how much property and equipment is going to go in there. I didn't want to get all in the weeds with the finances, but, you know, uh, 
every company gets to depreciate their equipment that they use in their day-to-day -day operations. Correct. And I was just curious of like how much that depreciation is on this particular operation. Like, is it going to be uh, going to be twenty percent, or is it going to be six percent? Is it going to be ten percent? Because I do have to sort of get an idea of how much your property and equipment is going to be worth at there the five years. Uh, that's just that's just something that's us crazy finance guys think about. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but that's just what I wanted to ask you to. Uh, that that's where I was going with it to find out how much you're going to be putting into this this operation, and how much personal property is going to be the case here. It seems like you're just going to put in concrete bunkers. It's going to be you have to have you would have to have more in your operations than that, right? Um, this is where you do all your business. Is the correct? Bunker. So inside the concrete bunker are the linear or rototron accelerators and a conveyor system to go through to carry the product um, into the bunkers and back out. Uh, we're also looking at putting in automation to help the employees load the the product onto the the bunker or onto the the conveyor. Um, and you said that this is a process that you use. It's it's the last process you use in manufacturing. That's a, the last process that medical device manufacturers use in their process of making medical devices. So they will make their medical devices in a clean room, and they're clean but not quite sterile. Um, so they have a choice. 50% of the sterilization in this industry is with ethylene oxide, that poison gas. 40% with gamma, and only 8% with e-beam. Um, but as I said, <coughs> ETO, the FDA is is now saying you can't use ETO unless nothing else will work. So they're trying to force people away from that. Um, with gamma, there's only this much gamma available in the marketplace today, and that's all there will be forever. They can't increase that. Um, so the only industry that can really expand is the e-beam industry. And right. although we're only 8% right now, the whole market is growing. <coughs> there are currently 50 radiation facilities in the United States. And the industry is growing at 10% per year, and that means you need five new ones every year just to keep even. And there hasn't been a new facility built in the United States since we opened six years ago. So everyone's at capacity. We are turning customers away. Um, there was a, a swab for the COVID vaccine um, detection that we couldn't sterilize because we're at capacity. We turned them away. They said, well, where can I send it? I said, I don't know, everyone's at capacity. So they, don't, they, they never went to market. Um, so it's huge, huge demand. So we're trying to help fulfill that demand. Could you just go over with me one more time to break down the jobs? Uh, I, I, I took some notes, but I want to make sure I got everything correct. Sure. You said uh, I, about six engineers? About what? six engineers for the validation, um, about 10 quality people, three or four ship and receiving people, about 10 um, operators, and then the office staff, um, accountant, receiving, or, I mean, um, reception. And you said that uh, initially you're gonna start out with uh, probably 50 and hope to? Hope to go up to about 150. If, if, if what we currently have, you know, since this is a triple size facility, it makes sense, it would be triple. Have you um, have you petitioned the state of North Carolina for an incentive? Yes, right. And what did they say? Um, they offered a workforce grant. Workforce grant. Do you know how much that was? I believe it was ninety thousand. Beg your pardon. I believe it was ninety thousand. Ninety thousand. Have you? Uh, Thank you. <coughs> that was close. Ninety-five. <laughs> Thank you. Have you uh, talked to uh, uh, the municipality of uh, Burlington? Yes. About? Correct, and I have a presentation there tomorrow night. What What are you asking for from them? <laughs> They're uh, receiving a combination of uh, road construction assistance uh, and um, percentage performance grants, similar to what the county's typical behavior is. It's a combination. But you don't have we don't have a real number for me, a roll number. I have a real number for you. There's also yeah. one in the presentation. Okay, great. I've prepared one for you guys. Excellent. So. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. And this is going to be. Um, you haven't been in front of county commissioners before. For, no, for no. this. Okay. And uh, you're going to be locating on Anthony Road. Is that correct? Correct. That's all for me right now. Until I see the president. Okay. Did you?
have anything you wanted to ask? <clears throat> do you go into more detail on the presentation? I can ask questions now or later. I do go into more detail on the presentation. I wanted to give Mr. Nichols an opportunity to share a little bit about himself, the company. Um, I've got the numbers for both the state incentive package and Excellent. the local combination incentive package. I would have some cash flow projections. I would have held off if I would have known that. I just started <laughs> firing away. <laughs> well, that's all right. I, I think. Uh, Maybe one general question. Do you anticipate using the airport facilities for, for any of your needs, or are you more truck-based? It's mostly truck-based, but FedEx, UPS, I imagine they ship a lot in. Okay. The uh, any idea how many trucks will be coming in? You know, on a I daily would base? say at the maximum 10 trucks a day, okay. five to drop off and five to pick up. Yeah, okay. And then that would be the semi-trucks, and then maybe FedEx, UPS, and DHL. Okay. And to add to that point, and not to interrupt Mr. Nichols, but I did want to share the city of Burlington is going to do a traffic impact analysis on this project. So, um, but it will be in a light industrial space off Anthony Road, and the roadway is set up for that type of impact. Right. So. Well, as you can imagine, we've gotten a number of contacts concerning this since it's on our agenda. Let me uh, ask John. If he has any comments or questions he'd like to make, is he still on? Okay, he'll be on the screen. John, I think you're muted. There you go. Okay, I should not be muted now. Am I? <laughs> you're good now, John. You're good, sir. Okay. Uh, I think you've answered most of my questions. I've also been through the packet and materials that you've uh, you provided for us. Uh, I think the numbers work. I think it's going to bring in a new industry to this area. Um, and I'm, I just, uh, everything I'm seeing thus far is very positive. Thank you. Thank you, John. Are you guys, Thank you. is your plans to, will you do some kind of job fair? How will you go about getting your folks? Are some of them coming with you? Or are they going to be on Mass County or it, local adjacent counties? Or how's that going to go? The plan right now, and we will probably stick to this, is we'll probably bring in three people okay. um, the managers that know about the industry and the business, and then hire everybody else from this area. Okay. We got some really cool concrete people here. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Just look in the yellow pages. <laughs> well, I will say, looking at your, your processes from what I saw on your website, I was very, it was very interesting to see that flow of your materials through your bunkers and uh, how it looks like it's going to work. Uh, I can't wait to see what it might look like when it's finished. So, yeah, good. Um, Just one more thing: when you get that bunker built, I so want to see what that looks. Well, like. of course, we'll, we'll have a grand opening and, and invite everybody, of course. Yeah. And you'll work with the chamber, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Bill and I had a conversation today, and I think Bill took every question I had just about. So, uh, Well, I just started firing away. You did. Yes. Firing away. <laughs> you covered the presentation. The I maybe I haven't asked you this um, Okay. Uh, and I think you say you've got some stuff, David. So I do have a presentation, but I recognize that it comes a little bit later in the agenda. I didn't know if you guys wanted to re-enter that public hearing process or and solicit public input if there was any. Oh, or I, just, I can uh, just jump right in. Yeah, I'd like to hear what yeah. the company is presenting, and then let's hear from our citizens if there's anyone here who wants to talk. I agree. Okay. I think let, let them hear it, and then if they've got a question, they can address it you. in a public comments period. All right. Well, I will take the bulk of the presentation. Um, okay. And just Thank jump you. in if there's anything that I misspeak of. Will do. Because uh, I am not a scientist. But, uh, oh, excuse me. I do want to just provide a brief um, upshot page of project <coughs> wavelength that is this project so the county and the chamber started uh, to get involved in this project around summer 2022 project activity of course is sterilization of medical devices full-time jobs which we've already touched on is about 50 over three years the average annual wage is nicely above the county average about ten thousand dollars above the county average at fifty six thousand eight hundred um, there is that capital investment number of that $71 million with it broken out between real property and then personal property. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, Mr. Nichols, 
is forecasting that this uh, facility be operational by Q1 2024. So here's an image of the potential building um, for this project. Uh, as he mentioned, it's about 150,000 square feet um, and it takes place on about 13 acres of this larger conglomerate of uh, parcels, which the vision is to turn that into potential future life sciences and biotechnology park, which I do think speaks tremendous volumes to the great work that Alamance Community College is doing with the Biotechnology Center of Excellence and uh, the potential opportunity that we do have being so close to the RTP. So here's uh, the meat and potatoes of that incentive proposal um, of all the packages, right? So we have the proposed state package on the left. You can see a sales tax exemption um, valuation, that 1NC grant that was mentioned before at $95,000, a utility fund of 300, uh, DOT road improvements, 175, and then uh, the North Carolina Community College System is actually offering $85,000 to be towards customized training program, which would speak volumes to um, Mr. Nichols' commitment and uh, willingness to hire locally, right, to train our folks up. Uh, so the state package is approximately $3 million. Now the proposed local package, you can see the Alamance Chamber Economic Development Foundation did approve a $25,000 site work award. Um, so we're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, the city upfront incentives, um, as Peter was discussing earlier, that's valued at around $700,000. It includes necessary roadway improvements and infrastructure improvements, followed by a city grant for about $710,000 over the course of five years, which equates to about 1% of that total capital investment number. Now, um, the official request that we're making today uh, for you all to consider is an incentive proposal of around 2.5% of the capital investment and so that would come with a maximum evaluation of one million seven hundred seventy five thousand dollars so the local incentives would total again at a maximum assuming incentives are reached at hundred percent three million two hundred ten thousand uh, dollars I did run a county impact analysis for you all uh, you can see the yields um, over the course of five and ten years and this is based on, I just plugged it in as a 10% depreciation rate for that property. But is that accurate? I believe so. 10% right. yeah. depreciation mm -hmm. of your personal and real property. I believe that's what it, we have done in the past. Right? That's lower than the standard of, uh, in the industry. Um, I'm just, just saying. It's no big deal. You, you get to choose. I mean, sure. I'm right. not telling you that you have to right. do it. Sure. I'm just saying that that's usually, that's a little bit lower than, okay. than the industry. -wide. But that's okay. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Well, and I apologize for over oversight of that. No, I will not, revise that in the future. But it's pretty um, straight line, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, it's uh, just, just you know, I'm actually looking. I don't know anything about this business, so I had to go through and do a lot of research about how other companies, your size, and uh, um, how much they depreciate their capital. And that's the only why I was like, you know, I know I would be a little bit different. <laughs> so, you know, we're all t teachers our own, you know, it's just, sure. it's, it's all yeah. an accounting process is what right. we're talking about. And, and, and I'm not an accountant. Same thing at the end. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I do think that's a tremendous question because that does impact, you know, over the course of the next five years, right? But you can see with this analysis, we do have a, we're in the positive. Mm -hmm. We're not in the negative, which I do think is important to recognize. Um, by no means would the county, if you all um, were to invest in this opportunity or incentivize this opportunity, by no means would you all be losing money. So here is a graph for that cash flow projection. I won't stay too much on this. I, I do believe it's in your packets as well. And you can see um, the forecast incentive uh, per year uh, is described in that red line. And then the green is that um, total property tax revenue that you all would receive. And then here is a graph uh, showing the cash flow projections in comparison to the city of Burlington. Um, so I would like to note city of Burlington is taking on a tremendous risk with this property and project, uh, which I do think demonstrates um, the level of interest that they have in this opportunity. You know, they're doing 700,000 up front. Um, they're not gonna see that money back if, um, you know, uh, 
if we if we don't meet those hundred percent uh, investment numbers, right? Um, but as always with any type of incentive or investment, um, there are steps taken to secure our investments. So um, I always like to close out my presentations with an official action requested of you all. Um, so today, that official action um, that I'm requesting is the motion for approval of an economic incentive agreement value, uh, excuse me, valued at a maximum of $1,775,000. Again, that's that ceiling number or 2.5% the total project to be awarded as a cash grant over a five-year performance period for project wavelength, a.k.a. Stairtech. Um, and you can see it, some additional notes at the bottom. And these are some images from Mr. Nichols' website and industry practices. So with that, uh, that concludes the presentation. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Very Thank important. You. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Now we'll go back and I'll honor a motion to enter a public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. That's unanimous. We are now in a public hearing. Um, let's start with the my left. Anybody on my left, anybody in the audience on my left have a comment or a question they'd like to ask on this project? Don't be timid. I won't hit you but once with the gavel. So. Yeah, sheriff asked the question. <laughs> and then that's assault, right, Sheriff? <laughs> I'm just curious, hey, with this radiation, how, mm -hmm. how dangerous if something happens to one of the... Bunkers. An employee? Yeah. He's right there. How danger, what's the danger for the county if something <coughs> happens to, you know, one of your radiation chambers or whatever that you're doing? Well, the nice thing is... You turn it off, it's off. There's absolutely no radiation. No residual uh, radiation. No residual right. radiation. Okay. Um, if, if the machine is on, and somebody tries to go into the, the bunker, you open the door, the machine shuts off. Um, and it cannot be turned back on until somebody actually takes the key all the way inside to make sure there isn't anyone in there and come turn the key, come back out, and turn the key. You answered my question. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, the folks to my right. Anybody there? All right. Raise your hand if you ever want to make a comment. Come forward and give your name and address. My name is Alice Wesselman. I live at 2966 Maple Avenue. Um, and I'll if you could put the map back up so we could see the location that was really interesting I hadn't seen that before it's very close to where I live um, I, I am very um, I'm a environmental engineer and have a lot of experience with the EO processes and I know many of my colleagues have died from exposure so that's a little more than hearsay for me um, and that's excuse why me you're, you're supposed to be addressing your comments to the Board of Commissioners okay um, so I have um, worked as an environmental engineer and have had experience with with medical device ethoxylation and it is a, it's a true hazard not just for the people working in there because there's a lot it, it doesn't it takes a, it takes a long period of time for that stuff to totally um, off gas into a safe environment before so if somebody goes up and works around it they can get um, Chris, they get, they can they can, it takes ten to fifteen years, but they'll they'll die of bone cancer. Now you're talking about the other process. Yep, oh. yep, and we and those have been located in this area. Um, so I that's why I came out here because I, I didn't know what this was. I do um, also have experience with the type of technology he's talking about because they use it in semiconductors. They have it in Cree, uh, IQE, all these people. Um, uh, Corvo and a couple other companies use the same technology, not in as big of a, of a, a device. So my question is, um, the, the 10 trucks coming in and out is not, not a total number. I mean, I am concerned about it's already really fun to get out to 40 in the morning. 
um, and because the current uh, interchanges are inadequately designed for the flow that's there and this is a state highway so it's not something the county is going to be able to to manage uh, like have we had some conversations with the state dot to to make sure our traffic patterns from the highway and and, and especially if this is expected to grow i mean that's that's one concern the other concern is um the from from an environmental standpoint after listening to him i understand the technology i'm not worried as much actually i don't have very much concerns about it um i have uh, from an environmental standpoint at this point i do cons i am concerned about the impact on the power structure this this takes a lot of electricity um we already have a lot of power outs i work from home we, we experience li uh, loss of power and loss of internet probably at least once a month uh, and it impacts um, productivity so how's that going to be is that been looked at have we evaluated that or is, are we going to uh, i'm sure it's going to impact their business do we have some 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 data on how how we're going to ensure um, that that we have enough power grid to, to facilitate such a power use okay. and the third thing is 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 one of their attractiveness is they're going to your, your time is up uh, okay Thank you. You're no problem. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the right? Hi, my name is John Mazaris. I'm at 2966 Maple Avenue, Burlington. Last name John. Mazaris, M A Z E R E S. Um, I had some questions uh, as far as the, uh, the infrastructure of the total 85 acres. Is that all going to be purchased at one time? And what's going to be the total amount of uh, build out in this area? Because in, if you look at, I work in transportation, and if you look at total thing as far as improvements to the roadways and improvements to the DOT, I do work uh, um, for a consultant that does work for DOT. So traffic is very important, especially on a road that I live very close to. Uh, so I was wondering about that, and I was wondering about as as far as the the total amount of traffic that would be in this area over a ten or fifteen year period, uh, five years I think he's pretty well projected. But I wanted to clarify: is it going to be fifty jobs or harm fifty jobs at the end of five years? Because it wasn't. It's sort of I've seen mixed numbers in the presentation and in what I've what what I've heard tonight. Uh, that's pretty much all the questions I have. Thank you very much for letting me speak. I think the comment that was, or the statement that was made would be 50, uh, 50 jobs within three to five years. Is that correct? And they're going to put 150,000 complex, square foot complex on the 85 acres and then build out the rest of it. That's not what I understood to be. I heard 50 jobs in what I was heard, and this man t said tonight there was going to be ultimately 50, 150 jobs 150 in five over time, right? In five years, I just clarified. We're talking about 150 jobs, not 50 jobs. And I believe you said 13 acres. This way he's going to put it on. Right. You're doing 85. You're going to put this on 13 acres. 13 so acres. So he was going to build out another 72. Correct. That's over, what I understand. Over time, am I correct there, sir? That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vines. Good afternoon, Commissioner. My name is Henry Vines. Uh, I live in Snow Camp. Uh, I stand before you asking you to not approve this incentive. As it's been mentioned here tonight by all these folks here, uh, that this is the perfect place for this uh, company to expand into. They've even acknowledged that their self, that they have the training and all the necessary things that needed to be done here at ACC. So why is it, commissioners, that we have to pay these people to come? If we needed jobs in this county and we're needing to expand our employment opportunities, I can understand. But we can't even fill the jobs that we have. Our own sheriff is having a trouble even getting deputies to serve with him, starting salaries at forty-one thousand. And I'm sure that a lot of these salaries are way below that forty-one thousand when you're talking about fifty-one thousand dollar average. And also, as the gentleman just said, 
we're looking at uh, the possibility of 150 people working there and the possibility of several other companies located within that 85 acres that he's talking about. Now his facility is only 13 acres, but he's talking about all these others coming in. So you're talking about a huge amount of traffic that's going to be funneling out of there in the near future. So you have to take that into account too. And I know firsthand because I've worked over there in that area, worked for Burlington Industries for 20 years. That traffic that comes off Anthony Road and comes into 49 is a complete disaster. Each and every day. You cannot hardly get in and out of there. It was doing construction work and the traffic was backed all the way back to Burlington the other day. So, commissioners, this, there's a whole lot more studying that needs to be done. The other question I have is this in the city limits of Burlington? <coughs> and if it's not, does this not fall under a high impact ordinance for Alamance County? Or are they going to have to meet those ordinances like other high impact industries? Because this certainly would be considered a high impact industry in this area. So I would, uh, I would like to request that y'all not approve this thing if not so much as if they want to come that's fine but I don't think that we should put taxpayers money into investing into a, a business as the gentleman said I looked it up he's they've got a opening in, in uh, Dallas I don't know what it was open or not maybe he can tell us that because it didn't really say clearly on their website whether they were not open or not I didn't count the 28 employees standing out in front of the building in their picture so they might have been some absent but i would just request commissioners that you deny this incentive <coughs> hello uh my name is sean francis uh the village of alamance uh, and i just wanted to say just a quick comment that i know the people along 62 in the village of alamance would appreciate somebody saying I hope that God those, you know, ten trucks a day are not going to come down 62 and turn on to Anthony. I hope they all come from exit 145 because we have enough problems with traffic going through the village of Alamance now. It's a kind of a historic town, very small houses that are very close to the road, and they have a lot of problems with speeding. I know Sheriff Johnson hears about that complaint all the time. <laughs> so seeing a lot of big trucks coming through there, I know would kind of raise hell with with the citizens there. So I just want to just want to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Francis. Anybody else? Sam? Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Samuel K. Moser, <laughs> and I was born in 1940 in Alamance County. I live on Maple Avenue, Burlington. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. First thing I would like to do is I want to personally thank our Sheriff Terry Johnson for his dedicated service to the people in Alamance County and all over our state. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. And also, all of your officials that work with you, law enforcement, deputies, whatever, thanks to all of your law enforcement people that work with you. Next thing I'd like to do, uh, Certainly, I'd like to thank uh, and commend Mr. Larry Nichols, I think it is, for uh, Stereotech Corporation. It sounds like they're building a great company. And I want to commend them for and their employees for what they're doing. I would have to say that I am concerned about not myself paying taxes, but our future generation. I'm concerned about our grandchildren, your grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren. I'm just wondering what Alamance County is going to be like 30 or 40 years from now if the corporations keep coming in Alamance County and don't pay their fair share of tax rate. What kind of demands are we putting on our water, our sewer system, our landfill, all the services that Alamance County uh, employees offer, 
what kind of demands are we putting on these organizations? One thing I didn't quite understand, have we gone this far? Do we have a traffic study or not? I didn't, I've got my hearing aids on, I still don't hear good. <laughs> have we had a traffic study? I don't believe so. Was there a traffic study done? Has it been done yet, David? Uh, it's not been done yet. Okay, thank you. It's scheduled. And then I wasn't sure if I understood, has the city of Burlington already offered $700,000 up front? I didn't understand about that. No, so those are still in negotiation. The city of Burlington has their public hearing process for this project huh. tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What this request was is to offset the cost. To offset the cost. How many Alamance County citizens that you represent have purchased and built houses in Alamance County? Approximately about 75,000. How many small businesses have been started in Alamance County? About approximately 4,500 are listed today is small businesses in Alamance County. Your citizens, how many of these businesses have you given startup money to? I'm just asking you, being fair to our citizens, let's say no to this incentive request. Let's welcome this company, commend this company, but I'm just asking commissioners, let's say no. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Anybody else? <clears throat> Nobody left in the overflow room, John. Okay. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed. Okay. Do I hear a motion on the request? I've got a question, um, Mr. Carter. Um, does it, it's a question for the, either the, for the county or for the city of Burlington. Has anybody done any uh, advance work on a new exchange at the Tucker Street exit for, uh, for Highway 40, 85? I'm not aware of anything from the county's perspective. Oh. I you know? possibly speak to that. Yeah. <clears throat> is, is that all right? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Turner. Uh, Peter Bishop with the City of Burlington Economic Development Office. Uh, we actually have been revisiting the Tucker Street Extension Project, interestingly enough, somewhat in relation to the gentleman's uh, comments about NC-62 and looking to relieve pressure from both NC-62 and from NC-49. Uh, so recognizing that there are capacity issues and design issues at each of those interchanges, um, we, uh, we, we had a conversation actually just last week with uh, Wright Archer, the division engineer, about that, uh, about six and Tucker Street and possibly finding a solution for uh, some of that traffic. Uh, so it, it has been, I guess, revisited very recently. Uh, our last request, and it's still in the, the, the STIP process, it just never scores very well. What's that? Uh, it's the State Transportation Improvement Program that NCDOT puts together, and it's a formulaic uh, thing that really doesn't build roads very fast, quite frankly. Um, but uh, it's been you know, put through that process multiple times. It, it, it has not scored well, and part of that is because it's within one mile of two other interchanges, and the Federal Tra uh, Highway Transportation Administration um, wants it two miles. So there's, there's ways to get around that, and we're working on it. We actually have a, a, a federal lobbyist that we keep on, a retainer that we work on this issue with, and it's at the top of the list. Uh, so it has been addressed very recently, uh, and we're hoping for a solution in the future uh, around each of those interchanges to maybe have another one and take some of that pressure off and provide a more direct connection for some of the industrial traffic that uses NC-62 and NC-45. Uh, I'm 49, rather. Another question. That map that, that we saw mm -hmm. had a number of parcels, and I think there was a comment that this was uh, part of a, a life sciences, yeah, that's a, 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 li a potential life sciences park. Mm -hmm. um, w uh, there's some talk of 13 acres, 80 acres. How many parcels of that so total that, parcels would this take up? So what you see, the, this project would be uh, parcel number two on that map, so about 13 acres. 
And then of the remaining 72 acres, you're probably looking at a half a million square feet spread between all of them, maybe a little bit less or more, depending on the different site studies. So all and of those, one, all of those. two, three, four, so four additional parcels. Are all those you, parcels the parcels that, that uh, Stereotech is buying? That's correct, yes. Okay, are there additional parcels outside of these 72 acres that there that is one in the very top you see it says an area to be dedicated for right uh for uh, greenway i'm sorry i can't, I, I can't. The, there's a little area right about right underneath the word life sciences and it's labeled area to be dedicated to greenway it's about 10 acres <coughs> and there's a piece of this parcel that's inaccessible without bridging little alamance creek and the the residual parcel there really isn't of value to this development or any development interest because of the cost to access it mm -hmm. so it's very likely that it will remain open space or possibly possibly become part of the Nova Lane little industrial area. The little Tishi train mm -hmm. company backs up to it on a little parcel there. So there are some areas that will not be developed. And then you see this green hash in there. Those are, um, uh, there are uh, drainage ways there. So they're not developable. They have a riparian buffer around them. So those areas are protected as well. How about broader areas uh, that are around the airport that are not just part of this track, but mm -hmm. other sectors around the airport, is that is that can you convert that into a life sciences park as well or is that well there there are other the there are other larger parcels this is the only parcel and this uh, actually if we go back to 2012 this this uh r plan was first developed then when the sheets project came through right. so just below that last uh 3b just to the south of that is where the sheets plant is so when sheets came in the, this was the remainder site for the uh, holt farm that's out there, the George Holt Farm, uh, and it was subdivided on this plan at that time. And you know, since 2012, it's been waiting for a buyer. And we were, you know, I think, fortunate to find a buyer who's interested in both developing their own business there and then inviting other companies they work with to also bring their locations here. There's been some concern about water sewer. Is this mm -hmm. the city of Burlington with its service water and sewer for this entire site? Yes. And is there capacity in both of those to do that? There is. Uh, this is in our south plant uh, that this would flow to. And actually, the Golden Leaf Foundation provided grant funds to construct that red line sewer main that you see going through here to sheets that goes to a, a larger main that uh, services around uh, Little Alamance Creek. Uh, we do have ample capacities uh, in both our water plant and sewer plant for this build out. Um, and uh, the impact for uh, this project is very minimal. This is just employee water and wastewater usage. Uh, there is some power usage, but uh, Duke Energy has confirmed is providing a rider. Uh, so they've confirmed the available megawatt power for this facility and, of course, all the other facilities that would come along with it. Thank you. Oh. Um, Peter, there was a question, too, about it being in the city limits of Burlington. I it's in the city limits of Burlington. This is actually in the extraterritorial jurisdiction, uh, but it is uh, our um, agreement with uh, Steratech is dependent on them being annexed into the city of Burlington. So this will become city of Burlington property. Okay. Another quick question for, for the county. Is there a mechanism that the county would use to ensure that Steratech is meeting its um, its requirements. I mean, is, that, is, that, is there a process that we would use to, to determine that? I mean, we're not just going to trust them, are we? Yes, sir. We have a contract. <laughs> that they, we're working with uh, with Rick on to draw a contract with them to make sure that they're meeting the requirements, and if they don't, they don't get paid. So. Yeah, they have to provide proof of employment and investment before any of the incentive payments can be made. Is that yearly? Uh, yes. 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 Annual. When you say they get paid, does that mean it just comes off their tax bill or do we hand them a check? That's a big question. We actually pay them a check. You, you cannot not charge them for taxes. That's right. Yep. That would be illegal, correct? Correct. Yes. It's not illegal to write them a check. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. That's After correct. they've paid their taxes. Correct. Write them yes. a check. Yeah, okay. And met the performance metrics of their contract. What you gonna do with that money? You're not gonna like, travel. <laughs> I'm just curious because I, I hear all the time. It's like you know we're just handing money over to corporations. We're just doing that. I mean it's um you know and I, incentives have always been a real touchy issue because I know in this world that's part of getting 
industry here. That's just part of the game now. It's like an incentives package because, you know, what are you going to give me? It's like buying shoes, buy one, get one free, so to speak. I know that's simple, but still, it's a way to, you know, to build our county because um, if we don't have industry and jobs, then our taxes have to be a lot higher than what they are because we have to pay for what we have to pay for. So I I'm, I'm just had to ask that question because I get asked that question all the time. That's always been a real sore spot. But it is to help pay for the tens of millions of dollars that we're investing. So. Like you say, it's competitive out there. We're looking at a few other states to try and figure out where we want to go. And this particular area is, seems to be the most attractive. Because we're just great. So I'm glad you're here. Okay. I guess. I don't know if you're here yet. <laughs> Bill, any other questions? Yeah, I got just one. I just wanted to just make a statement to the to the board. Uh, I hope that we are listening carefully about what the city of Burlington has told us. They have not done a road construction and performance impact analysis. Uh, I think the reason why we better pay attention to that is I hope you uh, can can remember uh, of what we have going on in Snow Camp. When we didn't dot our I's and cross our T's, we found ourselves, you know in a world of hurt, so to speak. And I would certainly not like to jump into this if we have not done that traffic impact analysis uh, for the city of Burlington, because as we've just been told by several folks tonight that this could be, and they can see that where we could have some traffic problems here. Um, I just think we should, maybe should not rush into it, and maybe we should wait until this impact analysis comes back or, you know, and see what the city of Burlington is going to do. Uh, you know, I think this process has, um, has has went a little faster than probably we need it to um, as we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Um, as far as, you know, I'm s so proud that you folks are taking a look at our county because I do think that we have a lot to offer. And as a county commissioner, I know that I certainly have worked hard to try to keep our tax rate low, so it's a, it's it's an imperative it's it's comparative advantage to our other neighbors. That you know when you look at a place when you want to uh, bring your business, that Alamance County shines like a, sh a shining star because we try to take care of our finances and we try to take care of our county. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that Alamance County offers offers you that is worth a whole lot more than 1.8 million dollars. And that being one of them, our tax rates very We have the best tax rate in the state, and I, I, I am proud of that. I also know that we have labor costs that is compared, competitive to anybody in the state. And I also think that the location, the location is perfect for your business. That's just three things. I got a list of 10 others that are worth more than $1.8 million. Tax rate, labor costs, location, water, and education. Alamance Community College is a great resource. Elon University is a great resource. And I think another thing that makes this a great place for your business to come to is the fact that we have we have a whole lot of folks within 60 miles of us that's great for your business, potential clients for your business. UNC, Duke, East Carolina, uh, I mean, all the all the, uh, uh, the hospitals in, in Greensboro, Bowman Gray, and Winston-Salem. We have a lot of people who would probably like to use your services. And I think that's worth a whole lot more than $1.8 million. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you have any other comments? Uh, you know, I think you've answered my, my questions. Uh, it looks like a real positive economic uh, opportunity for Alabama County. Okay. Thank you, John. Do we have a motion? I'll say this. I'll lead up to a motion. Um, I don't like incentives. I, I don't know that many of us do for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about tonight. But I do like $71 million worth of investment. I like the possible creation of a, a long overdue commerce park in Burlington. We've got a commerce park in Mebane. 
one in Graham, but Burlington hasn't had one. And I think an effort to do that around the around the airport is a worthy idea that again is overdue. Um, especially one that is focused on life sciences, which connects with one of the county's largest employers in LabCorp and a reference lab that is, if not the biggest in the country, one of the biggest in the country, and that connects with work that ACC is doing with the biotech, uh, the new building for, for biotech, which is a capstone building, which sits as a beacon to draw folks to the, the university or to the, to the college right by the highway. Uh, and, and expanding that life sciences program to connect with new industry in the in the county and the fact that this is something new it's cutting edge and that could create an anchor for a life sciences uh, commerce park in Burlington I, and the good folks at Stairtech may may come down to Mass County regardless of what we decide to do tonight but maybe they won't and I just hate to play chicken with $71 million of, of infrastructure. Um, so that being said, I move that we, that we apply the economic incentive grant at the levels that are in the packet. Do I need to mention that? Do I need to state that? No. I'll, I'll second. Sec You'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Just, just one thing. I can remember with Mebbin and the bridge over 119 and the, the circles. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's, that's, that's stressful. <laughs> we, we acclimate, we just. I can remember across the street they built Smith School. And uh, I had red mud for a long time. And then they built the condos. And um, my son was four, and we'd sit down in the front yard and watch bulldozers. It's a great thing for a kid. And it was a mess at first, but I got the best neighbors ever. <laughs> that that change is kind of like changing carpet in a church. <laughs> you just have to kind of just hold on and be patient and all that. Um, I hear what Craig's saying, and I agree with it. it they're so hard decisions. They really are because there's this side and this side. And, um, and we want to make everybody happy. But um, I look at how Mebbin has grown. I mean, they are just booming. Graham is changing. Burlington, we all are changing. I hear what Sean's saying about, you know, going through the town of Alamance. That, that's, we got to think about stuff like that. We just got to think about things that could possibly be our problem and try to prevent them now before they happen. And that's just good planning. So uh, that, that's it. Okay. I've got a question. I would really like to know what we can do about it. We've had a lot of concerns raised here today about the traffic study, about the traffic situation. Now, I live right near there myself, and uh, sorry to say it, guys, I don't ever have a problem getting out of Grand Oaks Boulevard on Alamance Road. Uh, traffic light there doesn't seem to be a problem, but I don't, I'm not familiar with spending a lot of time at your intersection that you're referring to, so that does concern me that people are concerned about that. and. Uh, um, I'd really like to know more about that study. Mr. Martin, I could possibly answer that question for you. Sure, Peter. If you could um, go back up to the dais. I apologize for interrupting you, sir, but I've heard this mentioned a few times. Uh, as I was talking to uh, David Putnam earlier, uh, through the uh, technical review committee process, pre-application hearings for the actual construction project, right. this this property will be required to go through a traffic impact analysis. So it meets one of the five triggers in our unified development ordinance that requires a full study engineered, you know, stamp study of the traffic uh, okay. impact that will happen both on this parcel individually and the, the future parcels that you saw on the map. Okay. Uh, that will likely involve turn lanes off of Anthony Road. It could involve improvements at the intersection of Anthony Road and 49. It could, in, uh, you know, involve improvements elsewhere. Uh, but that, that happens at the development level process. Typically, we don't have traffic impact analysis for um, speculative or non-committed projects. 
So as of right now, this is this is not a project. It's still a, a prospect. It's still a potential. Um, so that capital and, and that will be done by the applicant. So okay. they will be the ones that will hire a traffic impact analysis engineer. They will conduct that study through our UDO uh, defined process and we'll get results. And if those results indicate improvements are necessary, they we will need to build those improvements. Okay. So those all will be addressed during the development process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, is it appropriate to uh, ask for an amendment to the motion to make our decision contingent upon a satisfactory traffic study? I think you need to vote first and then ask for an amendment. Okay. Um, it's already been moved and seconded, so you need to be a vote at this point. And then if it doesn't pass, then you could ask for an amendment, a second, and then another vote. Okay. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Is that three? Okay. I seconded it. Seconded it. I'm going to say no, but. Uh, I vote no as well. And oh, what did, did John okay. say? He can't vote. So John can't vote. He's, He's not able to vote. That's, that's a change in the. Okay, four, two, two. Change in the law as a result of us not being under an emergency proclamation any longer. No problem. Okay, so we've got a 2 2 vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I would like to make a motion to accept Mr. Turner's motion and amend it to make the final decision contingent upon a satisfactory traffic study. You need a second and then a vote. Did I get a second? Was that a second, Bill? I'm sorry. No. No second. <laughs> What, what kind of timing is that? What kind of, who knows? Peter, Mr. Bishop. Um, you're probably looking at, I don't know, 60 days, okay. something to that effect. Um, as David is not a scientist, I'm not an engineer. So uh, I'll, I'll, we can do our best, we can accelerate that. Um, I, I would maybe ask for a little clarity on, on outside of just satisfactory. I guess I'm just curious what, what I guess I, I'm understanding in this motion what Alamance County wants out of a traffic analysis. What's the result that would be satisfactory to y'all so that we can instruct everybody in the proper fashion? Is it just to have a study conducted or is there some sort of result you need implemented? What do you hope to get out of this study? I'd, li I'd like to find out that the traffic study says that they can do the, the work that they believe will create a, a, a lesser problem for the citizens trying to get into 49 and any other intersection that might be created by this. Mr. Carter, could I ask a question? Sure. Uh, does Burlington, would this project require a traffic review committee through Burlington's planning department? Yes. Yes, a traffic impact analysis would be required as they go through their technical review process and development process. So it's, it's, it's going to occur. It's going to happen whether we amend the motion or not. That's correct. Okay. Yes. And our staff would not allow, if improvements are required through that traffic, I mean, it's, it's an agnostic analysis. It looks at the traffic issue and gives a recommendation and we follow the recommendation. Okay. We as in Burlington. That's correct. Who, Burlington owns the roads. Uh, in this case, this is a, this is a, a state road. Okay. Uh, but, so we would be a partner with NCDOT, but yes, the, we, we do also build roads and do a lot of road construction. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll withdraw my motion. And um, would you like to repeat your motion? I move that we okay. approve the economic incentive grant agreement for Star Tech. Can we vote? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Is that 3 1? 3 1. Okay. It's approved. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, I, I think one of the issues that the manager and I were speaking about is that there needs to be, we've already voted on the issue in that capacity. There needs to be some sort of amendment if we're going to vote on the topic again, if that makes any sense. 
So we've already voted up and down the issue as presented by Mr. Turner. So I think he needs to either amend his motion in some way uh, or someone else needs to make a motion, but I don't think we can vote up and down the same issue twice. It, it went, the first time we voted, it was 2-2, two, two, correct? Correct. Mr. Correct. Paisley's not here. Two yes, two no's. Correct. And I'm just making sure we're doing this right. And we had an amendment. To Proposed. Well, we had we had a we had a proposal for an amendment. It was rescinded. actually just a comment. And we were sent it. Yeah, it was a comment, and, and never got a second. Correct. correct. So we need a different motion, um, or a motion made by a different commissioner that seconded and then voted on in a different way in order to comport with the law. You can, can it be the same motion by a different commissioner? I think I think that's. Doesn't look good. I honestly don't know. <laughs> I, my preference would be that it's different in some way because we've already voted the issue up and down. I don't think having a commissioner give the same motion, in a, but different commissioner give the same motion, I don't think that gets the job done. You need I prefer to, to have a change. Rule for Coach you need to make two motions in the same meeting. Add a toast to the offer. <laughs> um. Okay. Can you um, Madam Clerk, so. could you please read Mr. Turner's motion? I'll make a different motion. Uh, I move that we, we approve the economic incentive grant agreement to a total of $1,774,000. Is that is different. $1,000 less. $1,000 less. Yeah, I think the other option is to have one, have someone, a different commissioner, move to reconsider the issue um, and then revote. But that's certainly an option as well. I'll second Mr. Turner's motion. Is that okay? I think that's okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Like so. 3 1. Thank you. Okay. Are we clear now, Mr. Stevens? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Gatewood. Mr. Vice Chairman, how are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the Commission. I think my role tonight is to uh, give an update on our Public Safety Training Center. And I have a team of people here to help get that done. I have Chris Verdick, who is the Director of Basic Law Enforcement Training. I have Andrea Rollins, who is the Vice President of Finance. I think you know her, and she will answer any financial questions that Tom Hartman cannot answer. And I think Tom I is called a, her a turncoat the other day, didn't I? Yeah, well, what color was that coat? <laughs> <laughs> we have Tom Hartman, who is the, uh, you know Tom, the Vice President of Administrative Services, and Gary Saunders, who is the Vice President of Workforce Development. Now, we also have with us this evening the uh, Honorable Sheriff Johnson, who is a member of our team. He's been supporting this effort along the way. And by the way, Sheriff Johnson, congratulations on, on um, your recognition. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so let me start by saying that we've made a lot of progress with the Public Safety Training Center. We've had a number of meetings, and we've actually had a meeting out in Green Level with the mayor and some of her significant others to make certain that they are aware of exactly where we are, and that's what we're doing yet again with you this evening. 
So what I'd like to do from this point forward is to ask Tom Hartman to come up and speak to a PowerPoint that I believe you have, and then we will um, uh, add to that as, as necessary and answer any questions you have. I may be out of order. In fact, I probably am. Forgive Wouldn't me for that. Tonight. That is correct. <laughs> but I want to just mention that with reference to Stereotech, last week Alamance Community College received notification of a $2.5 million grant for biomanufacturing. And with that grant, we will invest in the third floor of the Biotechnology Center of Excellence building. Super. So I, the timing is really coming together nicely. Tom, would you please come forward? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Let's see if I can make the technology work here. Hopefully. Do y'all need to push that up? You're kind of almost in the pew, or whatever you call it. Moving how you there wish. You go. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm tripping over that and uh, falling back. So. <laughs> um, again, I appreciate you having us here tonight. And uh, I presented this information to our oversight committee a few weeks back and was asked to come tonight to, to share an update with you of, of where we're at. Um, again, the main thing that we're doing right now, of course, the project is still moving forward with the design. Uh, we are also um, finishing up the geotechnical work, which is a, a big piece of the work, uh, getting the soil reports back. Those came back in on Friday, late on Friday. Uh, so we'll have some more information of the soil conditions and the soil report here. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll have a better idea um, you know, from our engineers and from the, the civil folks working on the project in terms of what the soil conditions look like. Um, to kind of give you a reminder, uh, it's a little small for you to see that, but that is the site plan for the Public Safety Training Center. Uh, on the top portion, there's a center road that you see. There's a circular road there that goes onto the property. But at the top section in, in the blue and gray, that's where the 15,000 square foot administration and classroom building would be located. Uh, a little further down from that is where the plan is for the indoor firing range. Uh, below that, uh, again in that circular area, that's where the uh, the fire tower and the uh, uh, the burn building would be located. And then that large gray area, that is the emergency driving pad. That's where the um, emergency vehicle operator course would be located. So that is the scope of the project, along with, of course, all the site work involved, uh, bringing the utilities in, et cetera. So again, we're, our, our biggest point of that right now is we're waiting for that uh, geotechnical report to come in. And um, we will have a updated estimate on the project costs from Samet, which is the CM on the project, the construction manager on the project. We'll have that at the, the, the latter part of October, 1st of November, is what the, the plan is at this point. Again, ACC's uh, <coughs> commitment to the project, back in, in November when this was on the ballot, uh, the budget started <coughs> at 10.4 million. Uh, in April of uh, 2022, uh, again, funds were transferred uh, with the uh, permission of the uh, commissioners from the um, from the ACC reserves as well as ARP funds were set aside uh, from the county for the project that brought us up to a budget of 12.9 million. In August of 2022, uh, we were able to, to come to the commissioners to have uh, some of the county bond funds transferred from the biotech project because of fundraising and additional funds that were uh, made available uh, on, on the equipment side for the biotech building that gave us that, that ability to move that, uh, that fund of about 2. I think it's about 2.9 million uh, to the project which brought us to a little over 15.8 million. The component construction costs are listed there. Uh, the, the most recent estimate on the right is uh, as of July of 2022. And if you follow it down toward the, the, the lower portion, you'll see that the total project budget is a little over $21 million, uh, with the indoor firing range piece being uh, approximately $5.3 million. And again, this information is all based on uh, the information that we have currently. And again, once we have the soil conditions back, that may um, adjust those numbers somewhat. So right now, with the funding that the, the college has for the project, uh, this is the scope, uh, the administrative classroom building that I mentioned earlier. Of course, the driving pad, 
uh, the fire training facilities, and unfortunately the, the funding is not there for the indoor firing range. And that's one of the things that our um, uh, oversight committee that we talked about, and that's why we, we came to you tonight, is to share more information about what that indoor firing range, um, uh, how that will impact the project, uh, how that will impra impact um, Green Level and the county. And we've asked Chris Verdick to, to speak a little bit more about that. He'll talk more about the, the project itself in terms of the, uh, the agencies that will be involved and how important this piece is to, to the overall site and what it brings to Green Level. So, so with that, Chris, I'll bring you up and I'm gonna skip past this one. I already talked about the project status. And Chris. Before Chris comes up, let me just mention mm -hmm. one thing. I want to remind the commissioners, I want to remind you how we were able to move the $2.9 million from the Biotech Center of Excellence building to the Public Safety Training Center. And the college raised from, from private and other funds, non-public funds, I should say, $7.8 million. Now, if you really think about it, that was our, our goal was $5 million. We raised seven point eight, so we were able to move some dollars from that building uh, budget right. to the training center. And that's how much we believe that we need to have this training center. So, Chris, sir. now you may come up. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, I saw you came in with your hard hat. I left my body arm. <laughs> I left my body armor in the truck. Okay. <laughs> so the. Uh, the impact of this training facility is going to be huge for Alamance County and, and especially uh, for the area out around Green Level. Um, just the, the amount of training that we're going to be able to bring into the county that we're unable to do right now. Um, the impact for the firing range would add um, approximately 773 more officers coming into the county to do this training. Okay, now Some of them are already local officers doing this, but I've got letters from five different state agencies that say that they would come here to do their qualification training also with their firearms um, should we build this range. Um, that's North Carolina Wildlife, the State Bureau of Investigation, North Carolina ALE, and Highway Patrol, Highway Patrol and um, License and Theft also. So there's, um, I've got those letters with me if y'all would like a copy of those. Um, but we've got commitment from all the agencies within the county plus agencies outside the county that would come to use this facility should it be built. Um, the benefits of, of the indoor range, um, we currently at, at any of our other ranges that we may utilize, um, we have to stop firing at, at 10 o'clock at the latest. Um, and that's just out of courtesy for the surrounding um, area of people that are living there for the noise issues. Um, and it limits us to when we can do nighttime qualification. We have to do it um, late spring or summer or early fall um, so that it stays, it stays light longer, right? So um, our nighttime qualification would be later in the fall or early, early spring, typically when our weather's not so good, which is another benefit of having the indoor range. Um, you've got climate issues. You've got officers showing up to the range on their designated days and they're unable to shoot because of weather, um, whether that be um, a storm that's coming up or high winds or what, what have you. There's also the environmental impact of shooting into a berm um, where that lead stays uh, until it has to be re reclaimed at some point down the road when the range is closed. Um, with an indoor range, that, that lead would be uh, recycled. Where do, you, where do you train now? We train at um, the Sheriff's Department range at Bog Ranch, Boggs Ranch, mm -hmm. and we also utilize um, Burlington's range when it's available. That's outdoors. That's outdoors. Um, but with um, both of those ranges, we can also do rifle qualifications, which we would also be able to do with this indoor range. Are you planning on not training at these other two that you just told me? Right. That's it, right? So what happens to those locations? Well, I think the Sheriff's Department would continue using Boggs Ranch um, other than in the event of, of uh, inclement weather or, or some unforeseen thing like that. And Burlington, I'm sure, would continue to use their range. But the other agencies within the county, you know, a lot of them go to Boggs Ranch now um, or they go to train to defend out on 49. So it would be, or family traditions, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Um, so it would be uh, a matter of them coming to us rather than utilizing Ball Ranch. Because you've got Elon 
um, Gibsonville, Elon University, um, may have been a lot of these other agencies that don't have their own range. It's turning. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I think you said you had some other information too. Well, I have uh, Gary Saunders here who is the Vice President. Gary, did you have anything you want to add to this? If you look at the numbers, we gave you for uh, the numbers too, this is 773, um, and that's the baseline students that we're training pretty much now. But if we had this facility at, at marine level, we'd like Chris said earlier, we could bring other agencies in. We could do more training, specialized training for local agencies now. Because of the, our facilities are limited in space and sometimes trying to schedule a week-long class that's not normal for law enforcement, it's hard to do because you got college classes running two or three days a week and it's hard to get a space for that one week. We're there, we could do this. And the sheriff's been very good about helping us run specialized training where we paid part of it they paid part of it, even Burlington's paid a part of it, and Graham will do If you see something happens on the news that's new or that we need to think we need to update our officers, this county is very proactive in doing this, and this allows us to do more of that. But also it bring some more people around green level. If you have a more presence of people there, the economic value there is not just what it can do for the college, but what it can do for that community too. But I, I've been here 10 years, and the sheriff can tell you, we've worked hard at, at, at this college, and at law, we have a great agency with the law enforcement commitment in this county. All the agencies work together, they, they get united, they invite the colleges to the law enforcement association meetings, and we always are proactive on ways to find out how to help and better train the police officers to help the citizens of this community. And I not only commend the sheriff for 50 years of service, but I commend the job he does in this county every day because we work together. And I will promise you, I've heard other state agencies say that we have the best training facility in the state. And I'm not saying that just because I work there across Chris is one of my employees, but because I've heard it from other agencies. We had Chris criminal justice standards come in and I asked him about our program. He said, I want to come see this program. I asked to, to be the altar for this program because I've heard so many good things about this program. And I ask that you continue to support us and we need your support. I appreciate everything you do for the county, but I appreciate if you continue to support us. So thank you. Gary, I think what you mean is we have the best curriculum and the best personnel. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I would be derelict if I didn't ask uh, Sheriff Johnson to make any comments that he wished to make, and then we'll close out our presentation. Commissioner, you know the uh, attitude toward law enforcement today and some of the problems that we're encountering. Training is a must. Uh, right now, if it's raining and we schedule a, a shift to be able to go to the range and it's raining, guess what? They don't get to qualify. Guess what? When it gets dark, they don't get to qualify. Mm -hmm. In the range that we're asking for here, the shift could possibly get on work, go down, and do their firing. And they do it two times a year. But I've also talked to a lot of agencies outside of Alamance County. They said, we want to come to that training center. I've even talked to the state training center, uh, uh, and the, they have state training center in the west and one down in Salemburg, and they said, man, we'd love to join up with the programs we do, which means we don't have to send people down there or up in the mountains. The people would be coming here. It would be a great economic, first of all, impact for Alamance County and the town of Green Level. But if we don't have this indoor range, folks, it's gonna be some problems. Now, I'm just telling you. Uh, you. You would have to go down our Boggs Ranch. It's gonna be, it's probably within the next year or two, they're gonna have to be closed because of the lead content and stuff into the banks, et cetera. And they only have so many lanes that a shift of uh, 12 people Right. or two shifts come, you don't have lanes for them to shoot. We have got to have this uh, indoor range. We promised Green Level it would be an indoor range to keep the noise down. This range is such that they can pull a car in there and you can shoot off the car like you would wind up out on the highway or something. 
This is very important to the entire project here. I don't know how we're going to do it, but you know, anything I can do uh, to help, I'm going to. We have got to have this range. And you know, I know uh, y'all are saying, wow, that's a lot of money. It sure is, but one lawsuit would build that range if our officers didn't get the training. Thank you. Sheriff Johnson, thank you. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our update. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay. Uh, got a couple questions, uh, Commissioner sure. Carr. Dr. Gatewood, can we back up a second and just talk about the PSTC generally? Sure. The, 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 the reason ACC is, is building it is fundamentally because it, it trains uh, students in your basic officer leadership. Class. Is that is that accurate? I mean, that, I know we're starting back really general, but is that that is an accurate statement? Okay. We are the institution in this county that provides basic law enforcement training. We provide uh, fire training, emergency medical services training. Combined, we before we started the venture of the new public safety training center, we had things, and we still do, all over the place. We don't have a home per se. Now, one caveat to that is we did retrofit one floor, what we call B building on our campus, where we have some of the emergency medical services training. Of course, at the training center, they would have access to classrooms there as well, and also the driving pad. We don't have that anywhere else, not within the repertoire of, of resources that ACC has. So we're providing a service to the people of this county and beyond. And as Sheriff Johnson uh, indicated, providing that service is, is how we keep well-educated, well-trained, 21st century thinking and practicing law enforcement personnel, fire and EMS. Do we think that the, that the basic leaders or the basic officer training will your numbers and enrollment will increase because they will that, increase. Is that part of the plan? Th that, that they will, yes. Gary was very conservative with his numbers. There is no doubt uh, that those numbers will far exceed what we have, but we wanted to be, I guess, conservative. But yes. I'm just wondering if that's, I mean, like, we're, ACC is centered on bio, biotechnology. Is this like a cornerstone focus trying to increase enrollment in this? And I'm not trying to lead you, I'm just trying right, to understand. Right, right. I'm trying to understand the genesis of why this happened. Yes. Okay. And then, and then I want to understand its connection with the county, and then, and then broader, just so I get an understanding. Right. Of I why. do my best. Yeah. But uh, let me go to biotechnology for a moment. Yes, we, that is a center of excellence, and we have declared that to be such a few years ago. The, I I believe that the public safety training center will also be in itself a form of a center of excellence. I think it will be a regional training center that will draw people from, of course, from Alameda County first and foremost, but from surrounding counties as well, uh, especially if we have the firing range along with the other features of that uh, facility. Why did we want to do it in the beginning with? We needed a home for, for those programs that I just mentioned, and we knew that if we had the appropriate facilities, then we can not only provide better quality training, but of course the numbers will go up as well. Okay. And all of that feeds back, yes it does feed back into our budget so that we can provide uh, instruction, equipment, and supplies and materials to support all of our programs. If outside agencies use the firing range or the whole center, is that, is that a generator of revenue? I mean, do they pay It may very it? well be. Uh, I think Chris may be able to answer that better than I can on the revenue generating part. It will generate FTE, which equates to revenue for our college. But in terms of revenue that we would charge to various agencies, I think you can handle that if okay, it's sir. okay with you, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Um, it, and it would. It would generate income for the, for the college, revenue for the college, um, which in turn allows us to provide more training for the in-service side of the house. Um, we've got one of the largest basic law enforcement training programs in the state now. Um, we've got um, we've got people coming from all over the place to come here, um, not only to recruit our cadets, um, but to send their officers to our academy. Um, I, it's and it's 
I lay this all on the, on the, at the feet of the instructors that we bring in and the staff that I have. I think they do an amazing job um, working with these cadets, children um, that want to become law enforcement officers. Um, you know, I spent my 30 years with Burlington and, and loved every minute of it and I wasn't ready to give it up yet. So now I'm helping to give back by training the, the younger officers as they come into this. Um, but uh, the range, bringing, bringing agencies in from other, other areas um, will generate revenue for the college. I mean, I, I love providing a service, but typically, you know, when you right. think about providing a service, you also think about something in return, and so. Yes, um, yeah, the, it would, um, and, and I don't know, Gary may have to answer the dollars and cents thing. I'm, I'm all about training the people to where they're safe and they're treating our citizens right. That's, that's what I'm all about as far as um, the dollars and cents. Um, that's his role. Chris don't have a seat yet. Stay in case you okay. ask more questions. Before you go, can you just tell me if NC Wildlife, SBI, NCL, Highway Patrol, Licensed F, are all these agencies going to stop going where they're going presently they're, and they're going to come here? Yes. They're, they're, right now they're currently hunting and pecking wherever they can go. Um, so if they had a central location where they could send their officers, especially the, the officers that are or agents that are um, assigned to the Central District of North Carolina, they're going to come here. And we've got letters from their colonels <coughs> stating that they would come here. And are they going to pay to come here? The, the, we will earn FT off of it. And that, by that, I'm saying they would enroll with us. And that's how we generate our income is through the number of students we have by the hours they take. And with the base, just a, a rough estimate of what I think conservative is, we'd go up by at least 35 to 40 percent on our FTE of what we had to have that we could make off of these students. The other thing is when we're talking about this program is now we have to have 20 square foot per student and we're limited on what how number of students we can bring in. We, um, we had 32 students this time in basic law enforcement training and a lot of agencies schools around the state are having trouble even making their programs not having a student to start them and that shows a lot about what chris has done with our program that we're getting students as he said all over the state we have a good quality program but it will grow we just need the space to do it in but we can like i say we can generate at least uh, 35 to 40 percent more than what we're doing now with this range and with these facilities so if mr lashley and i decide we want to be police officers come on I know. I want you to get through POPAC. We're going to pass. But hypothetically, we have to enroll in ACC and we have to pay tuition. No. The, the officers for uh, basic uh, law enforcement, you have to be sponsored through an agency. You can't just come in and say, I want to be a police officer. There's got to be background checks, and Chris can get more into that. But you have an agency to sponsor you to send you to the program. The sheriff in Burlington, some agencies do pay some students while they're in uh, class to go, but uh, they they have to have a sponsor saying you're qualified to be a policeman. Does, you can't just come in and say I want to be a policeman, take the program. So the sheriff is possibly sponsor. Sheriff would sponsor me to go to the building that we're building. Yes. If uh, if you qualify, That's like yes. Well, Don't other panic! Agencies. I am not going to enroll. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to get how this works because all this money, and I'm trying to figure out how you're going to make money to pay for it. We get it a, just our gift. An FTE is 512 hours. Would okay. be one student or 10 students or 50 students. Okay, okay. it's a tier two uh, payback, which for the college is approximately 4,600 dollars okay. for that one FTE. So we're talking about we could. 35 to 40 percent more FTE. So we're talking probably roughly off the top of my head, 250, 300 thousand more annual to the college for the FTE we'd earn off of this. Now, if I decide I don't want to be a detention officer, am I going to have to go through this program also? Not this program, but we do have a detention officer program with less hours, but you do have to go through that too. And, and starting next year, you'll have to go through the program before you can even become a detention officer. So telecommunicators use the facility, detention officers, if we did had a prison in this area, they, they'd have to use it. So it's not just basic law enforcement here. There's mandated training. A law enforcement officer has to get 40 hours a year for mandated training, and 16 of those on firing range alone. And 
they because luckily most officers didn't know how to pull the gun. Sometimes they had to spend more time on the range right. to requalify. So those hours are accounted for for FT also. Now it's SRO training because I know that has to happen too. Is that going to be through this? Yes, and SWAT training too. Well, I would think that would pull off the state as well. We uh, we we do all the training. Um, we have some very good people do the training. Like I say, SWAT teams train with us. The uh, SROs, detention officers, telecommunicators, basic law enforcement, highway pro. Highway pros even send, they have two schools for BLT. They send officers to our BLT program to start their career in. So. Now, I think I told you, at our last Governor's Crime Commission two weeks ago, the head of SRO training for the state spoke. Will he be here? Or if we, if he, he could very well be, you okay. know. Um, I don't know if he would lead that program here. No, we, we train our own people here. Okay. okay. Um, we, now, we had to go through uh, criminal justice standards to get the approval, and instructors had to be qualified through CJC to become an instructor. We'd, it's not just an uh, officer go down and say, hey, I want to train policemen. Right. They have to go through a certain criteria and training to become an instructor. A question for you about the economic impact above what it would bring into the college to the community approximately how many times do we have students that come into the classes that because of travel time and distance would have to spend the night in Alamance County to stay here and eat when they stay here to eat out and whatnot with the with, with other agencies coming in you'd see more of that than what we have now a whole right. lot more if they're of local it. they yes. wouldn't need that but if they were coming in from Raleigh or um, the wildlife's even talking about sending them from the eastern part of the state and maybe the western part of the state if we could get them here and they would definitely have to stay for a week at a time or however it much be but just the our students alone being able to eat at green level and all that would be you know more time uh, because they'd be there all day they wouldn't have to worry about going the, the good thing about it is we eliminate travel time for our students also that are already in our program we're having to commute them from the training center now, Burlington to Boggs Ranch or wherever to do some of the training. Also, have to do off site. We can use the fire um, buildings to do some of the training that we had to take off site now too. So we could be a whole lot less travel time, and they could spend more time in the community too. But the also you got a the impact of the law enforcement in Green Level, where you'd always have people there too. That would help the county. We typically run three basic law enforcement training classes a year. One will start in January and then we'll have a night class that'll start the end of February, first part of March. And then we'll have another uh, regular day class that'll start late July, early August. So all year long, we've got something going with um, new cadets, which is about 70 to 80 um, potential officers that'll come in um, that would be going through this, this uh, I know that, that, that program is more than one week, so there are multiple weeks of training. It's yeah, 15 and weeks. here for what, five days at a time? Yes. 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 So if they're coming from. It's a four and a half month at, program. At some point, they would make a decision to spend the night in Alamance County versus right. driving back and forth to their hometown. And there's a lot of other training that we offer also that brings officers in from outside of this area that they would be spending the night rather than sending them to Salemburg or to Indyville. We had some training a couple of weeks ago for um, um, EMS that we had people from all over the state come in. Also, we had people from Virginia and other states, Maryland, come in and they stayed for the whole week for training. So we do have that impact, yes. Right. Okay. I just have one question to piggyback on, on this. I just want you to paint me a land. I want you to, like, I don't even know how to spell gun range. Is there any, are, are there any facilities and the counties that surround us that do this at all is in Orange, Guilford, Caswell, Rockingham, Randolph. There's there is there just paint me a picture of what the landscape looks like for ranges. I don't like this one. I don't know, um, to be honest. I know um, Randolph does not. Randolph <laughs> doesn't. I don't think Orange does. Um, Greensboro does not. Um, have an indoor range. Nobody has the size of indoor range this one. Nobody does. Nobody around here. Aware. I know Winston Salem has. has what's, a, what's the landscape look currently? Winston what? Salem has a, an indoor range, um, but I don't know of anybody closer than that. 
What about Wake? Because when I took the FBI Citizens Academy, it was at Wake Tech, and cadets were in the back, police trained to be police officers. Right. So, and they were taught we were supposed to go off somewhere, I don't know where, to do all these maneuvers, and um, but that was not there at Wake Tech. I don't know if Wake Tech has one. And, and you know, a lot of the issues are, are primarily with our basic law enforcement training is the travel. Um, you know, we've got these 30 young people, 19, 20, 21 year olds, um, that we're expected to be leave here and be here in 30 minutes, and we have to get start, started training again, right? Um, that doesn't always work out so well. So it's um, not only are we losing 30 minutes of training, not to mention if they're late getting there, or if they were to be, heaven forbid, in an accident on the way. Um, just having everything on the site, one site, would be beneficial to that. Um, and that's just for the basic law enforcement training. That's not taking into consideration all the other things that would be brought into this facility should it be built. And as Chris mentioned earlier, when we have officers to come in training, they, a lot of times they schedule them a day off or a day that they're not on the duty come in if it's raining or something they're delayed they have to reschedule so it causes creates problems for the local agencies too in scheduling and rescheduling too so, and that's dollar spent where you had a, a deputy or a police officer scheduled and you had to pay them for both training in and what have you gotten out of that day too so you gotta look at that impact any other questions Comments. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to call for a 10 minute recess. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. We're back in session. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair, can I be heard? I should have lit a cigarette fixed here. I don't smoke. We should smoke. We should all start smoking at the meeting. If you're going to have 10 minutes, you might as well have a cigarette. But then you'd have to have an adult beverage to go with it before long. Oh, okay. be a really then 10 minutes becomes 15. Yeah, I digress, though. Yes, sir. Uh, can I be heard on yes, one matter related to a, a vote that the board just took? So um, I've had a few minutes to do some research here, and I wanted to clarify for the board what I think happened earlier during the voting process. So uh, Chair Paisley is not here this evening for, for reasonable cause. However, the law does not have uh, any sort of parameter or any sort of mechanism for excusing a board member from attending a meeting and thereby voting at the meeting that he or she is required to attend. Uh, the only mechanism for excusing from votes is for perceived or real conflicts of interest. And the board has a policy that addresses an issue in a time in which a board member does not vote and that person is deemed to have voted in the affirmative on the issue if he or she is not excused from the meeting or the vote and there's been no vote by the board to excuse chair paisley this evening therefore i would say uh, based on what my research has concluded is that the first vote that was taken on mr turner's motion passed by a margin of three to two based on Mr. Paisley's not appearing tonight and voting on the issue directly. So I just want to make sure that you're all clear that that's what I think happened. The second vote was redundant to the first, and I wanted to throw that out there to give you all the opportunity to be heard on a motion to reconsider <coughs> what happened in case now with a better understanding of what did happen, you might want to reconsider what you did, if that makes any sense. I'll be happy to take questions. thousand dollar difference <laughs> yeah. there's a difference there is so again in light of that if there's a motion to reconsider I think now would be the appropriate time to make such a motion do we have anybody who wants to make a motion to reconsider are we making it because of the thousand dollars or are we just satisfied with what we made because of what thousand dollars <laughs> Did that something was, that was less than like less than a thousand dollars less, right? Right. So you're saying what passed was the first vote. the first vote, which was for one million seven hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Yes, that's correct. Seventy-four. That no, no, he's saying seventy-five. The first vote was seventy-six. No. 
I thought it was one the more first. What is it, Thomas? I know you know. I get it. Well, I, I thought it was a, not, not that it get, I'm not trying to be a nitpicker here, but the, I thought we were looking at uh, 1.775. Correct. And he made it a thousand less, and unless my math is good, that's four. That's seventy-four. In the second motion, right. which doesn't count, in the first motion, which passed three to two, uh -huh. it yes. was seventy-five. Yes, I believe Thomas is right. Okay. The very first motion that was okay. made for the full amount gotcha. passed three to two. Gotcha. So Understood. the second vote redundant. Didn't, 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 doesn't matter. Arguably redundant, gotcha. and an issue that had already been decided, and so improper. So the first vote, in my opinion, should count. And so based on that, I'm just advising the board at this point that now would be the time to make a motion to reconsider. If there's any concern, if, if the number should be different than what was originally voted, I think gotcha. now would be a good time for reconsideration because beyond the end of this meeting, it may not be proper. Understood. I have no desire. I don't believe it. Okay, I'm done for now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving right ahead. All right. Ms. York, yes. I think you're up. All right, commissioners. Um, this is a continue, continued discussion from your last uh, meeting as well as the meeting prior to that. Um, the board is being asked to consider a realignment of your workforce development board um, from your um, uh, regional partnership group um, you've been asked to consider a realignment by the state of North Carolina Department of Commerce with the Piedmont Triad Regional Council and then at your last meeting you also heard a request from Guilford Works um, as to whether or not you wanted to create a new uh, board or a new uh, workforce development group so um, you asked to bring this back tonight to make a decision about which direction you'd like to move forward with. Um, we've had some conversations with the Department of Commerce since your last meeting who have advised us that no new boards are going to be considered as part of this process. So I wanted to be sure that you had that information as you move forward. Um, we have several folks in the audience who could answer any questions you might have. Um, your next step, if you're ready to make a decision then, would be to submit a letter of intention to the NC Works Board um, who would consider this an application for realignment and would give you an answer uh, effective for July 1 of next year for your Workforce Development Board. Okay, we've been over this several times. Do we have any discussion? Do we have a motion? We delayed this two weeks, yeah. right? right? For Guilford to whatever, because right. they wasn't part of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a couple questions, kind of get to, to purpose, and um, maybe the Department of Commerce may be a group of people to ask. Um, sure. So th this request to realign is coming essentially from the North Carolina uh, Works Commission. Is that fair? C can you? Just kind of give a very brief overview of who that is. Yes, sir. For, for, the, for the community at large. Yes, uh, Chet Motter said with the Department of Commerce Division of Workforce Solutions. So the NC Works Commission put forth a study to look at the 22 workforce boards and they put forth some guiding principles regarding uh, how workforce boards are, uh, how, they're, uh, how they're put together. And one of the things they looked at was how economic development and workforce development should be better aligned. And they looked at the map, as you remember we, uh, the, when I presented to you a, a month ago, mm -hmm. um, there was a map where we looked at the eight prosperity zones and we want to get the workforce, uh, the workforce boards better aligned with that economic development uh, prosperity map. And so one of the things is know that the folks from um, uh, Piedmont Triad Workforce Board here, uh, we at the Department of Commerce see the folks at the at Piedmont Triad as very good stewards of these federal workforce dollars and, uh, and think that the, well, you know, the, proposal, the proposal right now to uh, have Alamance County join uh, the Piedmont Triad Workforce Development Board is a sound one. But more broadly, the North Carolina Works Commission is a group of North Carolina citizens. Yes, sir. Business, business, who, like business folks. 
y yes, employers? Yes. yes, the NC Works Commission is a group. Um, they're a, a group appointed by the governor uh, and members of the General Assembly that uh, the NC Works Commission is kind of the overarching policy group that uh, advises various state agencies on how to use these federal workforce dollars. That includes the North Carolina Department of Commerce, the uh, community college system, just for those federal workforce dollars in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and also the Department of Health and Human Resources Vocational Rehabilitation. And, and we, the counties get federal dollars for workforce development, right? Yes, sir. Um, and as I understand it, not too long ago, there's been a change in, uh, in, the, in the way of thinking about how these dollars should be allocated from more money to individuals to train individuals, less of that and more aligning with the employers who you are targeting and aligning with the employer's needs and how they, they need to train workers for their, for their firms. Is that fair? That's, that's correct in that what we feel like is with fewer workforce boards that are aligned with economic development, there's going to be better use of those administrative dollars so we can use it, if the federal, the, you know, all the, every county gets an allocation of funds and a portion of those are for administrative work. And those administrative dollars we feel like could be put, put to better use with, uh, with a workforce board such as uh, Piedmont Triad and we really feel like using those administrative dollars more effectively could be put to more put more towards in programs such as employer engagement okay. thank you thank you thank you any other questions or comments do we have a motion If not, I will make a motion to uh, accept the uh, realignment process to move over to the Piedmont Triad Regional Partnership. I'll second that motion. Do we get a chance to, is it for discussion? Do we get a chance <coughs> to, yes. to uh, have input in the letter such that we can include uh, our desire that we keep the Career Services Center, that we, to the extent possible, keep employees who are currently employed employed for Alamance County uh, do we get to put that in the letter I mean is that something that we can request in the letter um, Chad, is that okay to add our own requests uh, obviously what you choose to put in the letter of intent is your choice uh, I would argue that you know, it's going to be up to the new uh, workforce board uh, to, with their consortium agreement to determine employment levels and do, roles and duties and that sort of thing. Um, and what sort of, uh, you know, what kind of priorities are set there. But certainly we can reflect our intent. Well, Matthew Doles and Wendy Walker Fox are here. They may be able to address those issues. I'm more than happy. So, you know, so we've had discussions um, with your staff. We have every intention on making it a seamless process for you. And so keeping your workforce facility open is primary for us. That's where the services are being done. Keeping good staff, we need good staff to continue filling that operation. What we'll do is if you send a letter of intent to the state, then we start work on the consortium agreement, which you would have to, again, approve as a board that final agreement with all of the other counties. And a part of that gets down to how we would handle workforce centers, um, how many folks you'd have seated on the workforce board, et cetera. And so we'll do that legwork. What I can commit to you is, and that's every, we have every intention in doing that. We've done that before as we've absorbed other areas in, into the workforce uh, area. And so, again, we want to make sure it's a seamless transition for folks in Alamance County. And for, from a service standpoint, the best way to do that is to keep the location the same and keep good staff in place in order to do that. Yeah, I'd already had some conversations and with Matthew and uh, gotten that same agreement and but at the same time I don't think there's anything wrong with putting it in writing so I will include that in the letter if that's yeah. there any other questions discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. oppose like sign I think it was unanimous thank you Bye -bye. thank you folks thank you Okay, budget amendment from uh, Terry for Terry Johnson. <coughs> Good afternoon, commissioners, or night, should I say? <coughs> <coughs> 
No, I'm appearing for you tonight. You know, we had the problems with school shootings and stuff around the nation, and uh, Burlington Christian Academy came to us and said, we want a school resource officer. I said, well, you're in the city of Burlington. We said, we want the sheriff's office. We will pay for whatever it takes. Next thing I know, they had said, what, uh, you know, salary, and this is benefits and everything. We told them $80,000. The check showed up here immediately, and an additional $20,903 check showed up to cover all the deputy equipment and stuff already paid. So we, we're going to ask you to allow us to take on the Burlington Christmas, Christian Academy SRO, and we have already be, been paid for the year 22-23. Now, will that be a contractual relationship with the Yes, sir. And they agreed every year the salary will be negotiated for the officer. So if y'all give raises, then they're going to have to okay. give raises. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Yeah. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank enough. you. Sheriff, you're still up. Oh, I'm on one of You don't get to go anywhere yet. My wife took my agenda when she left. Uh, detention center contract approval. Okay. Uh, this is a situation where, and I'll just say lightly as I can, we're having a, uh, several problems with the individuals that are serving food to our inmates which has caused problems within the jail. We have talked to them, talked to them, and talked to them until we blew in the face. And we are looking to go uh, within 90 days in the contract with that particular food agency and sign on with another. And we're looking right now which one to go with. Uh, the best one we found out talking with other sheriffs around the state uh, is, a, I think, called Kettle uh, and but. It's a little bit more expensive, uh, but food is rising uh, anyway. And, you know, we're looking. Uh, we've received a, a bid from Oasis and Kettle, and what we've found so far uh, at all the shirts that have the Kettle thing is more than pleased. And I, I would go in-depth on some of the problems, but I don't I think it's appropriate this time. I think the... Mr. Stevens, I think the contract allows us to uh, disengage within that period of time with that kind of notice. It does. The current vendor we have a 90-day cancellation with, and, and we can exercise that. And we do have another vendor. I believe they're called Skillet as to Skillet, the portion of their business. Skillet. <laughs> Skillet. They have a couple of different <laughs> operations, like, uh, but that's the portion we're going to go with, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, during that time, if somebody comes in with a better deal and we find out they're a better company, <laughs> And cheaper. Well, look at that. Hard. Is this within the state bid uh, requirements? Yes, sir. So, um, because it's a service, we're not required to bid it under state law. But our policy, our, our um, budget amendment, does right. require us to get approval for spending of this magnitude um, by the board, if even if it's a service. Okay. Do I have a motion? What do you need from us here? Just a vote that we can look for another contract with another company. But like I say, we've got two this, that have sent contracts in. We're going to have to study it and then the decision be made by the county uh, office here to uh, go with one or the other at our approval. So they could authorize me to sign. Yes, that's okay. right. For the board to authorize the manager to enter into a right. competitive contract with another vendor to provide food service for the jail after we cancel the current contract. So the proposal that's in our package is as an example of what it might look like, or? That's a proposal, and their proposal is based on a price per meal served. And I think like the sheriff said, and he's exactly right, in talking to other sheriff's offices around the state, um, our current food rate is, is very competitive, but it's gonna go up when we rebid it next year anyway. I believe their new bid requirement is in July. Our current contract expires there in any way, so our food prices are gonna go up regardless. Sounds like school lunches. It's yeah. always like that. Yep. Right. So the numbers that I'm looking at right here are, are real? Yes. Okay. Is does this come in a styrofoam box or is it made in the building? Do what now? Do these people prepare this and it comes over in a to-go box? No ma'am. 
it is cooked in the detention center. Okay. In that little bit of kitchen? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so if I may, um, we met with the vendor when they came to visit us on site and we asked questions like that. Um, what type of food products they use, where they buy their food stuff. So one of the things that they told us is that they do spend more on food, but they find fewer complaints generated from the food they serve. And that leads to fewer discipline issues, fewer injuries, fewer lawsuits. And I think those are all the things that the sheriff is concerned about and we are Absolutely. Do they use local vendors then? It's a Georgia-based company. Um, they have agreed to try to hire locally. Um, honestly, I don't remember the answer to the question as far as where they get their supplies. I will say, because I have some close personal friends across the street, that <laughs> it's like every school cafeteria. Um, every kid says, I don't like the food because it's not McDonald's, okay? <laughs> and I mean, who, you know, you got salt and fat and all that, that makes it taste good. And you got restrictions when it comes to the federal government's free meals lunch, and um, and and I hear that a lot. Don't don't like to hurt your feelings because it's just not what it is. No but um, it's I agree with Rick. I think sometimes, boy, if you got Chuck Marsh out there cooking on that grill every day, you would never have any discipline problems. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just it's something to think about because it doesn't take anything with that kind of level of pressure you're to get. I mean, it's jail, and it's not supposed to be comfortable. But at the same time, um, food can make a big difference. It, it makes a tr the little things matter when it comes to triggering somebody and them kind of showing out. So that's all I'm saying. And the pro process of tra or in the per in transparency, you're not getting any residual from McDonald's, right? No, I don't eat. Okay. It. I, don't, <laughs> I don't eat at McDonald's. I like to eat Coke. And that's terrible. Okay, now we got to ask a question about Coke. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there, Pam. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's, that's cover, right? I mean, I know it's you know, if it ain't your mama's cooking, it's just not right, and that's just it. But I, I'm thankful we have that in the jail that's available because sometimes, to be honest with you, that's better than what some of these folks have ever had, and and that's important. But the better we can do by that, I think, like you said, it, it can have a better atmosphere. Really okay. Put yourself in the inmate's position. You lock behind the cell there. door. You don't get the amount of food you're supposed to get, or you get cold food. Uh, you know, I wouldn't like that either. And there are some that like to stick their finger in your stuff, so you won't eat it, and they'll take it from you. So it's um, it's just tough, but it's jail. You know, there there's jail. So. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll, I'll make it. Second. Sure. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You gonna take your bag and follow your wife now? <laughs> no. <laughs> you took pine cones home. <laughs> okay. You got those papers I gave you, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. She took that with her too. Thank you. Okay, uh, county manager's report. Yes. Good evening, commissioners. I do have an item I wanted to bring to your attention. Back in February. The county discussed purchasing a property at 1128 South Main Street in Graham. This is a former bank building purchased um, to be used for a new location for the Board of Elections. And because I was not here at the time, it's not clear to me whether a vote was taken in a public meeting authorizing the purchase and designating the source of the funds for the purchase. So as a reminder, a contract was signed on 2-23-22. The purchase price was $931,932.38, coming from the designated fund balance for capital funds. So at this time, if the board would entertain a vote for the record, we'd need a motion to authorize the expenditure of $931,932.38 from the county's designated fund balance for capital funds for the purchase of the property at 1128 South Main Street in Graham. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. That's all I had. Commissioner's comments. I'll start with Mr. Paisley if he's still online. I am online. Did I wake you up, John? Yeah. Now I have to find the uh, unmute buttons. <laughs> but anyway, guys, good job. I'm glad we brought in uh, the uh, setup for the new corporation. 
I think that's a wonderful thing for both ACC, the county, uh, and for a new uh, area, 80 some acres, to expand into. And I just want to thank all the fellow commissioners for supporting that. I'm done. Thank you, John. Mr. Turner? Real quick, I just hope that at the next meeting we'll have the, uh, the library appointments on. Uh, I know Graham voted uh, Tuesday, last Tuesday, to nominate their appointees. It wasn't time to get on our uh, agenda, um, but I hope we can get that done at the next meeting. Ms. Thompson? Well, um, Commissioner Carter, myself, and Krista Knight, the peer support specialist for RHA in our jail, went to Surrey County this past week and met with their opioid crisis response team. They're absolutely amazing. Um, their director was a career Marine, 22 years, and then he went to work with um, DEA, he was an agent, and now they're leading that. Surrey County had had over 700 overdoses. They were in the top three for overdoses in North Carolina, Little Old Surrey County, Mount Airy, Andy Griffin, 90,000 folks. We met with them in Dobson, and they have a phenomenal team, and that's the point of what makes them doing such great work is they have a team. Um, if we are going to have a diversion center, and I'm supportive of it 100%, we're going to have to have something on the very foundation of this to really be able to do intakes in that jail, and because one person cannot do it. I mean, it is just overwhelming how many folks are needing services in that jail which is they're all connected to crime, to drugs. I mean, it's just all in the same bucket. And it was very impressive to meet with them to see that their, um, their county was really struggling. And so they put out a public survey to the county citizens of what they thought was happening to their county and what they said <coughs> their needs were. And this was it because of all the struggles they're having. I mean, it goes younger and younger, plus it's, it's just something else. But. Um, Anyway, and their chairman of the commissioners um, pushed for this to happen. I think they used some of the opioid money they've got, recovering money, and also they've done some grants. So I cannot encourage us enough, and, and they're big on recovery court. They are trying their best to go to that next step as well. And whereas they've got a team, we're way ahead in other areas. We are going to be building a diversion center. We have got a, a peer support specialist in the jail. They did not have one in the jail. Sheriff wasn't ready for that yet. Huh. And, uh, but I mean, these, these people are, are absolutely amazing. And I've asked them if they would come here to meet with our group to really see um, what we need to do because um, it's so nice to be able to follow somebody that's been through all the fire that's really doing it and it's really working and, and we can save ourselves a lot of time um, but they did they put the citizens of their county first because um, they've got MOUs with hospitals um, they, ju they just exactly what we're going to need and we can't be afraid to do that and go in that area um, recovery court is important I'm going to Harnett County to look at a veterans court 928 Tony's going with me veteran and, um, and any commissioner that wants to go, and um, it, it's so important that we look at the full wraparound services of the Diversion Center because we cannot count on just that building to take care of this problem. Every day we see in the paper about overdoses and deaths <coughs> and overdoses, and we keep seeing, I wanted to bring a picture of the, the colored fentanyl pills that are going after our kids now. And uh, today I even heard something interesting. I had an interview a client, and she said, "Do you know? Have you heard anything about vaping stores are selling these things that you can vape that will cause you to test negative? It'll give you a clear test if you have to go do something in a cup for your probation officer without saying anything else." But I thought, "Lord, have mercy! That now? Are you kidding me? Genius! The devil's got a big payroll, and that's who we're fighting here." So um, I just want us to be real open about this. I have requested um, for us to meet with the QR quick response team and the AC hopes or cares. Because I think as commissioners, these guys are on the ground, they're doing work, but I think as commissioners, we need to know what they're doing and how successful they are and how we can help them more if we have to. Because um, you just can't form a team and just, just abandon them. So I think as leaders in this county, we need to know what all is gonna be connected to diversion so we can make sure we are successful in this endeavor because this is a big money thing it is worth it it is worth to help anybody we can when it comes to drug addiction it, it still takes that person to have that strength to do it themselves but they have to have wraparound services and Steve you were with us 
and um, and you heard all the stories and um, they just got a phenomenal team and I know we could have that same thing here in Alamance County and we're going to have to be willing to do something like that if we really want to be successful in this war against addiction and mental health it's all in the same ugly bucket so but I was I said well my sheriff we're all in his jail so I've got to really brag about our county we're really far ahead as far as vision but we've got to have this this crisis team to start off to really start diverting these people to where they need to go. Mr. Lashley? I have nothing. Nothing. Mr. Turner? Well, I have to admit, uh, joining Pam and, and Krista. And you rode with me, too. I did. <laughs> She's a good driver. You paid your life insurance before you got that car. I'm a beneficiary, yeah. I was right there on the road. I'm used to my truck where I'm. He was in a Honda. <laughs> I'm used to, I, I know Hondas, but you got a tiny little Honda, sir. So. It's just me. <laughs> I was right there on the road. But uh, the Surrey County program was very interesting. The interesting part to me was when we got back in town. And you dropped me off. I parked over in the county parking lot, and uh, so I walked in to see the sheriff for a couple of minutes. And he laid an a, a, um, an org chart out in front of me that sounds very similar to what we discussed up in Surrey County. Mm -hmm. So I've asked our county manager to get with our sheriff and take a look at that org chart and develop some discussions around what we saw in Surrey County and what the sheriff has in mind for us to take a look at in the future. I gave him my copies of everything they gave us. Good. Scott. Okay. Well, then, no. then two. Um, I I got a got an opportunity when we had a visitation from uh, Tim um, Moore to tour the airport again. Uh, I hadn't been there in a couple of months, and uh, a lot of new stuff is going on out there. A lot of new efforts to uh, extend the runway again, extend and, and enlarge the airport. Some more new um, hangers coming, some new industry coming out there. And so I've asked uh, the county manager to get with, uh, and I've asked um, uh, Dan Danley, manager of the airport, to get with our county manager and talk about scheduling a time to bring some information to us so we can all find out about what's going on out there and what the benefits will be to our citizens. I've had so many citizens comment to me that we got we give money to the airport and you know what are we getting in exchange? And I. I've had to say over and over and over again, we tax those airplanes. And the tax on those airplanes that are, that are hangered out there is pretty significant revenue. I think it's a good idea for us to share that information and be able to explain to our citizens what's going on and what the benefits are, not just the economic benefits for having an airport, but what the financial benefits are to the county from what the airport provides for us in revenue. And then uh, James Walker has been to our meetings a number of times talking about the tarping issue in the county and I uh, see the sheriff standing still standing back there. Um, we have been fortunate enough to get a, a memo of recommendations from our county attorney. I uh, hope you all have had a chance to read that. If you haven't, I would recommend that we try to read that and let's have some discussion about what our options are and how we want to address that. I'd like to see us look at that in October. Um, as I think it's uh, Mr. Walker, whatever we come up with, if, if, if we don't have the same opportunity with ordinances that the Congress has of naming them after people, but he's been he's been persistent in being concerned about this issue, and uh, I think it's it's time to bring it to a head. And let's make a decision about how we're going to handle it. Can I just add one more thing? Um, I had met Mary Pollard, who's over at Indigent Services, which is the Public Defender's Office for the state, and when we went to our Concord conference. And so um, she met, when was that? Wednesday, Thursday, whenever. Um, met her at Village Grill and dragged Craig to go too. And so we met with her. I knew somebody really smart <laughs> to be there. And um, so we talked about that. And I'm very supportive of Public Defender's Office. It really levels the playing field with our district attorney because you have just a handful of lawyers that do the indigent Public contracts. Defender's yeah. Office, right. And, um, and one's just fixing to be changes. But um, I think that's a very supportive thing for Elements County. Um, I seen Judge Lambert at uh, Men of Steel this past weekend, and he, she met with the bar and talked about it as well. And from what I heard from Craig and other attorneys, it was pretty positive. So now that's a big that's a big deal for our county, but that hopefully is going to be seen in our state because um, you just don't have enough attorneys to handle all these loads of all of these 
type of situations that cannot afford an attorney to retain one. So I hope that's something um, that we look at and um, we may need one of those sheets that's whereas, whereas, whereas. We may need one of those. So it's just something to think about. I just want to plant that seed because um, she was wonderful to work with and talk to us about all the benefits of it. And um, I think that would be really positive in this county. Well, that's, that, that's in line with my last point. Sorry. <laughs> Um, a, we, I know the county manager has been having some discussions with the court system mm -hmm. about the first blush look at what the new court building or additions to the existing court building might cost. And uh, we're trying to take a look at right sizing the uh, dream package that was originally presented to us. So uh, I, I hope we get a chance in at the very latest and sometime in early November, I would hope to take a look at what the recommendations are about that process and what we need to do. We, uh, we can't have a new judge come here without a place to go. We can't be talking about public defenders without a place to put them. We can't be talking about so many things without knowing where we're going to put these people so, and how we're going to manage it. So. Well, you got, we're at a real threshold with our county to where we are growing. Unfortunately, we're growing in crime. We have to handle that. We're growing in opioid addiction and everything else. We've got to get ahead of that. We're growing in our schools. We want to make sure that our schools are balanced and, and they're talking about some things with zoning. That's going to be a really hot topic. Lord have mercy I went through that. That is, that is the most emotional thing you'll ever go through. Um, that's tough on, on kids thinking about where they're going to school. You want them to be happy and satisfied so they'll do well. Um, we're just at a real point to where we're growing and as leaders we've got to decide if we're going to be willing to allow that to happen right. because i don't want the taxpayer to have to fund all this i want things to come in here that's going to do that for the taxpayer at the same time we have to have balance we got lands and farms we want to keep them safe and we don't want certain things coming in the middle of snow camp again because that's been a real hard situation for folks we just it's just a real balancing act to make sure we keep these things really safe and, and working really well but we have got to get ahead of our crime we've had two young people <laughs> to lose their lives this is just rocking this community and it will and um, we just have to make sure our young people are safe because they are our future and they deserve a future so I've said the same thing final my final point <laughs> um, we had a report done, and I'm not confident of the date. The report, best I can recall, was 2009 on the relationship of property tax revenue on residential property and the cost of services and who's using the services. And in that report, the number that stuck out in my head, and I've heard it over and over again for years, was that for every dollar of tax paid by residential property owners in Alamance County, there's a dollar and forty cents of services used. Now, if you're using a dollar and forty cents on average for services, the way we make that up is from two sources: commercial, well, three sources: commercial prop, uh, property owners and in industry coming into the county, which is what we had a, an example of here tonight, and sales tax revenue, and then of course any other state revenue grants, whatever. But if we don't maintain a balance for our citizens with the growth we're anticipating, census is projecting us to grow by 2035, or by, yeah, by 2035 to 205,000 people, that's approximately another 30,000 people, um, and by 2050 to 235,000 people, which is another 60,000 people. So if we don't maintain some sort of balance and all that's residential and there's no industrial coming into the county, we're going to be looking at some serious tax increases to provide services to meet the needs of the people that live, will be, are living and will be living in Alamance County. So we need to we need to always be taking the time to take a look and balance what we're trying to do for our citizens. And uh, I know it looks like it's simple. It looks like it takes a couple hours twice a week, or twice a month. That's not the case, right, guys? So we. Have, Appreciate our team. We've got a wonderful new team here, uh, existing team and new team, and uh, I think we've got a, a great future for Alamance County out of the way we've structured our county now, and hope we can move forward and get all this stuff done. But we've got a lot on our a lot on our books. 
to get done. And uh, I think we got the right people in place to do it. Um, any other comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, excuse me. County uh, got a closed session, I believe. Is that correct? We do. No public comments from me tonight. You guys have heard enough from me this evening publicly. <laughs> um, but pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3, I would ask the board move into closed session and consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body. The attorney will advise the board on ongoing legal matters, including NAACP et al., v. Alamance County et al. Also, under the same statute, subsection A5, the board will instruct the, public's, the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the potential purchase of the property located at 780 Plantation Drive, Burlington, which is owned by Alamance Industrial Park for potential use by Alamance County Emergency Services. I don't anticipate any action after the closed session. Can we add uh, attorney-client privilege related to contracts involving food service at the jail? I don't know that it's appropriate to speak about that in closed session, but I'll entertain questions that you have related to it. Here now? Yes, I'll, if you have questions. I'll, I'll, no. Okay. Okay. Motion to uh, go into a closed session. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. We are in a closed session. Yeah, I don't know that we have anybody to announce anything to, but no action was taken in the closed session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com. TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.